right, people, all right. Inna alhamdulillahi wa kafa. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulih al-mustafa. Wa ala ibadi alladhi nartada. Wa man bi huda wa mihtada. Wa bi athari ahli al-madina taqtafa. Wa ba'ad. Fa salamu allahi ala al-qawm. People, we is back. All right. For another episode of Mind Trap with Mufti people. And by public demand, Jantaki demand, people, we've brought back the epic, the legendary professor of quantum mechanics, people, quantum physics, Dr. Mir Faisal, that you can see uh, the thumbnail right there of of Professor from a from episode twenty two, two episodes ago. It was so. Such an incredibly profound dialogue that we had. It was, I mean, I, I thought it was absolutely mind kind of blowing. Yet people, despite the profundity of the topics, people loved it. Absolutely. So, uh, right. So, let me just bring in right, our guest right here. Just bringing in our guest. Assalamu alaikum, Professor. How are you doing? Wa alaikum salam, Mufti. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Lillahi alhamd. Shukran, first and foremost, for sharing your time, your thoughts with us, for coming back uh, and really enlightening us with such a complicated kind of area and arena of science. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. <laughs> All right, so tonight we want to take a look at a lot of the uh, topics to do with the science and the Quran. That's uh, if I've if I've got us correct. That is correct. So it would be how I look at Quran. How do I get inspiration from Quran, and how do I drive meaning from Quran via which a scientific outlook. So there would be a specific methodology that I would be applying. Maybe should I uh, talk about that, Mufti, if that's okay? Sure, of course. So what is the methodology, Professor? Fire away. Tell us what's going on behind. What's the mechanism, the method behind the madness? <laughs> so I think, you know, when we are approaching this question of religion, of scientific interpretation of scripture, or specifically, let me talk of scientific interpretation of Quran. You are making a subtle assumption there. And if you if you don't take one of the two assumptions, then you will run into inconsistencies. I mean, one of the assumptions or one of the ways of reading scripture is that the meaning of scripture gets actualized at the early generations. So the final meaning is understood by prophet and his companions and the uh, and the old scholars, and that's it. Now, if you take this approach, then to take us then uh, then to go back and say, well, this verse is scientific would not be a correct approach to take because surely those people did not understand the things we understand about science it is impossible to uh, to assert that any of the scholars in past the sahaba or even the prophet would have understood it i mean when when it comes to worldly things prophet is a human as he has himself has, uh, asserted in one of the hadith traditions that i like i don't generally take hadith tradition but this one i particularly like okay so, <laughs> <laughs> which 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 hadith is oh the one about the Prophet being a human. Yeah, so when he said, you know, when there's this, when he suggested that cross pollination is not, not to do cross pollination, and then there was not a good yield, and you, you said, well, this, you know, this is. Oh, right. Uh, you, can, uh, you can do that hadith in a better way. I'll let you do that. Maybe you can tell us about that hadith. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, the hadith is uh, um, where the Prophet, I believe it is actually in. I believe it's in Bukhari, actually, if not in Muslim, but it's one where the Prophet walks past them and they are doing tabir, which is the cross pollination of the of the kind of uh, of of the agriculture, and the Prophet says he he kind of he finds it strange that they're doing that. Like he he doesn't rebuke them. He just says, "What are you doing?" Like and and they think he's t telling them you shouldn't do it. So they choose not to, and there isn't a the harvest isn't that well that year. So they complain to the prophet, and they say that you know, well, you 
kind of uh, looked at it strangely. So we refused to do it. And and the prophet says, well, why did you do that? What, what, I never told you to stop doing it. And he says, Antum a'lamu bi umuri dunyakum. You know, you are better versed well when it comes to matters of your world, of your dunya. Yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I mean, even if in the sense that even if Prophet made, his, like, you know, we have to look at Prophet in a, as a human being. So even if he said something, he could have some, said something not as a revelation from God in his human capacity, and he can make mistakes in that. That's fine. He can reflect the understanding that he would have of the age. It would be strange to assume Prophet to be this all-knowing thing. That only belongs to God. Prophet is a human example and a very wonderful human example for us. But if you take this other approach... Then in this approach, as Quran states in Surah 75, verse 17, that God takes upon himself the collection of Quran. But then it doesn't stop there. It goes on to say, Summa alayna bayana, in verse 19 of the same Surah. So if you take this approach, in this approach, the idea is that Prophet has the responsibility to, pro to propagate the Quran, to recite the Quran. God will preserve it. And after a time has lapsed, God will explain it. Which seems to me to be a better, uh, you know, better to, uh, approach towards uh, Quran. Because for all practical purposes, as to discussing this with my friend also, Quran is a overkill for seventh century Arabia. Like if you read Tawrah, it's perfectly suited to the needs of the time. If you read Gospels, it's beautifully suited to the needs of the time. But as I will mm -hmm. illustrate, there are sophisticated arguments in Quran which bear no relevance to, you know, immediate uh, addressees. Uh, they would have understood it in using, they, they could have understood part of those things using, uh, or maybe misunderstood it using the traditions of that time, but then that's fine. But let's, mm -hmm. so, so we come to the second point. So the first important point is that for me, the meaning of Quran does not get actualized at the time of Prophet or the companions or by far fetched at the time by his scholars, it, ha it it historically unfolds uh, because Quran is multi-layer meaning. One one version of that meaning gets, uh, uh, you know, mm. unfolded. But there are some... So what we're trying to say is that it's it's got this dynamism to it that people will <laughs> continue to extract meanings from, from that verse. And, is this what we're saying? And then it... Yes, mm. and it becomes relevant to every age. So, so you... So... For, for, so if there are you know people who who want to stick to we will only stick to the understanding of salaf they should possibly switch off they will get nothing from this thing none of it follows the <laughs> understanding of <laughs> <laughs> so maybe switch off because i'm not following the understanding of salaf my whole my whole idea is <laughs> that the meaning of quran will get actualized in future and i am i try to tend to take you are the future <laughs> professor you are the future yeah, <laughs> One of the futuristic explanations of Quran. Now let's come to another thing. It, it goes back to what I am saying, that Quran, uh, to this multi-level meaning of Quran, Quran has an inbuilt dual structure to it. Mm. You see, almost everything in Quran, almost all these descriptions, uh, if not everything, then almost uh, every, descri uh, every description of this sort, uh, can be understood using in a judo-christian way or using the traditions of the time perfectly understood in that you can have a perfectly consistent judo-christian reading of quran which would be consistent with judo-christianity and which would be consistent with the traditions of the time or you can have a perfectly scientific reading of the quran and both of these readings are sometimes intensely possible even though both of these readings can contradict each other but the mm -hmm. fluidity of Quranic language, Quranic language is not that rigid. It's so fluid that you can actually read the Quran in these two contexts. So there is this dual reading possible. Okay. So I'm not saying linguistically that reading is negated, but as I will show you that there is an alternative reading of Quranic verses. And interestingly, this alternative reading is 100% consistent with science. So some people can come up sure. and, you know, you... And say, well, this is not how how Salaf understood it, and this is not how scholars of old understood it. I never am claiming that scholars of old are under, would understand it this way. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is that they would understand it possibly in terms of a Judo-Christian understanding and the prevalent understanding of the time, and we will understand it differently. And both no. of them are consistent. Mm, I see. So but, it's not a contradiction to understand the Quran in scientific terms today. 
despite one could ask and they do that oh are you saying if you've understood let's say let's say you understood something about i don't know the multiverse based or the big bang based on the quran now surely the companions of the prophet didn't understand the big bang necessarily in that way uh so this is what you're answering isn't it you're trying to say well that's fine because both perspectives are still consistent Is that perfect perspective that consistent and future generation would come up and say faisal misunderstood it and actual perspective is this and that's <laughs> fine <laughs> people asking what we're talking about today we're talking about the quran and science people the quran and science that's what we're talking about so yep. so 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 first of all if you take this approach the approach i am taking that summa alaina bayana the meaning of quran will be you will be uh, god will and you know explain the meaning of the quran in future the and then word the, and then take this idea that you can have this dual reading of quran and this dual reading maybe one of these days in future um, you know mufti and me can discuss miracles and i can again show you how one reading and mufti can show you in, in a better way that how one reading is completely consistent with judo christianity and a different reading is completely consistent with science but take take they taking this structure here i will okay. add one thing though that there are subtle I... hints within the quran there are subtle hints within the quran that the scientific understanding possibly is the more correct understanding but this these subtle hints are so subtle and i will illustrate these subtle hints for example when i come to samawa mm-hmm. samawa that Allah... it would take it would take some sophistication to unveil them uh, to understand them properly and possibly the older generation did not have that so again not with <laughs> <laughs> are we are we throwing the older generation under the bus? <laughs> I got some respect for old scholars due to you but still I have a tendency to throw it. <laughs> I'm 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 happy for future generations to throw me under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh so you're saying there's some yes, indications Allah mia kuch ishare kar rahe hain. What are these still hints within the quran yeah? there are some beautiful things uh, signs ayats within the ayats ayats in ayats nurun ala nur allah allah so take it away professor take it away what's so again before i dwell on to the main topic so i will be discussing uh, samawat i will be discussing evolution and i will I be almost, discussing i almost thought beyond... you're going to i thought you almost snapped your finger then as for a moment i was like <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <like>, professor <laughs> professor is really <laughs> taking this passionately to snap the finger back <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> according to the laws of quantum physics it reappears over here <laughs> <laughs> no it doesn't it doesn't get snapped <laughs> at a more scale so so let's come to this particular idea like you see quran also very clearly indicates that there are structures that quran is discussing that people at the time and if it, it's addressing directly prophet at the time did not know for example in surah 36 verse 36 quran says that god has created peers and everything from what they and one and then goes on to say that from what they don't know mm-hmm. i mean it says well, from everything that grows from the earth which i of course take as you know half of the life is sexual and half of the life is asexual it produces sexually and asexually so mm-hmm. that's yeah, a nice yeah. pairing but but then it goes on to say and from things that they do not know mm-hmm. we know right now that for every matter particle there are there's an antimatter particle and photon b has its own antiparticle oh. and if supersymmetry is true that's a second pairing on top of that that every particle has its super part- particle but we don't know if supersymmetry is true but even if it's not true matter and antimatter we know for sure like every particle has its antiparticle we know it and there are of course we, we if supersymmetry is true we would have a second pairing and there can be other pairings that even we don't know but surely <laughs> this pairing they did not know even and this that is pairing is above everybody's bearings <laughs> <laughs> pairing matter and antimatter is pretty straight forward mm. for every matter particle there's an antimatter particle but universe is predominantly matter we don't understand why and we'll i'll, I'll come to that also later on but mm-hmm. but the important point here is 
Quran clearly says among things that you do not know. And there were things that people did not know in the past, like matter, antimatter, and we know it now. And if supersymmetry is true, that would be a second pairing. But there might be other pairings that we also well, don't know. What, and what you're talking and, about is where Allah says, uh, where he's saying, وَخَلَقْنَاكُمْ azwaja, or these kind of verses where he's saying that you have been made in pairs. And yep. you're taking it to the extent of saying, well, breaking it down to the molecular level where there's particles yes. and antiparticles. This is what we're saying. Yeah. Mm. Yes. But what I'm saying is that in verse uh, 36 of Surah 36, Quran clearly states, there are peers among things that you do not know. Mm. So it clearly indicates the knowledge is not like knowledge doesn't get summed up at the time of Prophet. Uh, uh, the other things, for example, take Surah 27 verse 88. Quran clearly states that you think mountains are still, but they pass away like passing of clouds. Now, mm. it's clearly saying to Arabs that you think that they, they, they are fixed structures, but they're not. They're withering and they're, you know, it's, it's a really nice metaphor to compare mountains and clouds. Because you see clouds form due to this uh, temperature gradient, uh, you know, the water, due to the water cycle, which is drawn by, you know, the temperature gradient, like you have the water vapor going up and then clouds form and then they wither away because of the rain. And because of Earth's, you know, the motion of motion, like motion of mantle inside the Earth, mountains are forming. And then they are withering away due to withering. So it's a nice metaphor here between mountains and clouds. But it's clearly telling Arabs, you you see them as still they're not. We know now they are not still. I see. But they didn't okay. Hmm. It's, a, it's a very clear, very interesting way of looking at it. Then another place where Quran, for example, gives this subtle hint where you can have a dual reading, but there's a subtle hint. Quran says sun, wrote, sun and all celestial bodies rotate around their axes. But Quran does not say it rotates around Earth. You see, a single word, Earth, would have rendered the verse unscientific. Mm. Yes, that is, it's a very good galaxy. point. Very good point. So, but, where it says, وَالشَّمْسُ تَجْرِي لِمُسْتَقَرِّ لَهَا That the sun, it, it flows in a set orbit. But it doesn't state uh, that around the sun, around the Earth. Whereas it, it could have, and people in its day and age would have accepted it because that's how they would have perceived yeah hmm. so you can see this dual reading of quran possible that you can the people in that age could have seen it as rotating around the earth mm -hmm. whereas we can see it rotating around the galaxy but a single word a single word would have rendered us uh, quran un, like this inter, uh, 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 it would have been it would have been game over that's all it yeah, it would to, have been yeah. game over because I don't know how well we would have been able to interpret although this. Some so this people, is although some people still are arguing that, the, you know, the sun's going around the earth. I'm, I yeah. mean, people are still, there's... Uh, uh, no. arguing for all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, there was a question here by, uh, uh, okay. by Kazi, Imam Kazi I saying, saw... please present the question that the earth rotates. I mean, this is an absolute given, isn't it? The earth rotating. I mean, I don't know why, because apparently some scholars from the Indian subcontinent challenged it. And not that they are astrophysicists, but they challenged it anyway. <laughs> They're like Chalo Humbi, you know, like, so they challenged it. And, and people today out of allegiance to the Imam, like, so Imam uh, Ahmed Raza Khan Brilvi has a book challenging saying that the earth stands still, I think it's called Fawzul Mubin or something. Uh, and so his supporters today will argue in defense of that. I mean, yeah, the fact that yeah, Ahmad Raza Khan could say something like that, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't want to even discuss his intellect after that. He, he was not in like eighth <laughs> century, which, which I would say is forgivable. He was at the beginning of this century. So, yeah, yeah definitely. Last, last century, yes, yeah, so 20th uh, century. So. When, when was it? When, I, think when was he, I, I think 20th century he was. Uh, beginning, yeah. I think, early 1900s. Yeah, I think. That's, sorry, we are already in the next century, the beginning of the past century. So definitely not uh, not, not a very intelligent person to say something like that, but let's leave that aside. <laughs> 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 so I'm not even worth discussing. <laughs> but speaking of this, I do think I saw a very horrible video where some, uh, some scholars had gathered and they were trying to preach children that earth is stationary. I watched preaching, this. I saw this. I saw this. Preaching of this kind, I think, should become criminalized. I mean, freedom well, of your... Criminalized? Like. 
yes, you cannot oh. treat children wrong facts. You can treat them any opinion you like. Right? Yeah, I, I think it should. <laughs> But we can discuss about that later. I do think you cannot teach children wrong facts. This is just childish. I agree with you. I agree so, but, with you on that. But let's come to this. Let's come to back to our point. Yeah. So, so, and, so and just as a, as a quick, uh, somebody has just asked. You know, people who say the Earth is flat. That, that I mean, that obviously that's dumb. But what's some of the immediate your immediate response to something as as uh, intelligent as that? That the Earth is flat, as in flat Earth is not not that. Buy the a Earth... ticket. Buy a ticket to various places on the Earth and travel throughout Earth. Go from. wherever you are from london to china and then china to us and then take another flight and you will come back <laughs> as simple as that but what but wait a minute but wait a minute if it was flat i'm sure they could still do that couldn't they they could still go from <laughs> <laughs> well they would be a strong edge right <laughs> this is dumb let's just stick to some really nice stuff <laughs> yeah professor is an expert in quantum physics He, he's into such deep things. You need to ask him questions on his level. Not is the Earth flat? <laughs> But you know, think that about flat Earth, or people end up laughing on people who talk about flat Earth. What they don't realize, people who rebuke theory of evolution or people who are speaking against theory of evolution, they're doing something as stupid because theory of evolution is as true as Earth being not flat. Yeah, And okay. I'll come to that. Okay. So, so, so. So even if the people who are, who, I mean, most people would laugh on people who would say Earth is flat, but then uh, they would not laugh on people who rebuke evil theory of evolution. But theory of evolution is just as as scientifically verified. But let's come to this. By the way, speaking of Earth being flat, mm -hmm. you know, I think the whole confusion comes from this verse in Quran where it says that Earth is spread like a carpet. Mm -hmm. Now, Loved. for me, it's a, yeah, for me it's a beautiful verse because you see, what is a carpet? Carpet is like a thin sheet you spread on any concrete floor or or ground or something which is thick to make uh, sitting on it more easy and make living on it more easy <laughs> and, and if you look at the crust of earth it's really thin and if you go see down uh, i think you the, it, it's really hot and the mantle and the core is really hot and and life cannot be sustained on it so if you look at this like a thin carpet uh, this crust has been spread around this really hot boy <laughs> hot mantle but See. this is something i i this is something i think even uh, maybe i'm i'm guessing that uh, people in the past would have understood uh, because they could see volcanoes erupting from earth and then there is this whole idea of in many mythologies that the hell is underworld it's under the earth mm. so this idea that under the earth there is something hot and then earth is a small carpet on top of it i think this is one idea that unlike mountains passing away like clouds i think maybe it is this is my guess that the people in that age could have guessed hmm. i mean this kind of verse uh, like the one in surah no wallahu ja'ala lakum al arda bisata that this bisata that allah has made this earth for you like a bisat which is like a carpet or something laid out basata means to lay out i think in many ways as well people would have just understood that to mean that it's being kind of as it was made it's laid out for you as in you can traverse it you can go through it you can travel uh i, I mean i think just the the common sense understanding would kind of suffice as in i don't think they necessarily saw that to mean right earth is flat or that you know some something so complex or you know they just understood yeah. that you could travel throughout the earth as in Yeah, and for me, when I look at the structure of Earth, for me, this verse gets meaning in terms of the fact that, uh, like, you have this thin crust covering mantle, and you know, the hot underneath, and this is like a carpet spread around in a very, in a beautiful, it's a beautiful metaphor to how Earth appears to be. Mountains as pegs against now, this is something very important. Mountains, okay. Quran says, we have put mountains as pegs so that it does not shake with you. Now there are two claims. one mm. is that mountains are like pegs which many muslims clearly correctly point out that yeah mountains have deep roots like pegs are supposed to have deep roots yeah. and that is fine but then there is a second claim and this is really critical okay the second claim is that mo mountains somehow stop earth from shaking so you would understand it as mountains stop earthquakes question the, now the real question is do do mountains stop earthquakes what do we know about it? okay This is the problem. When I try See, to do building up the suspense, we're building up the suspense, yeah. people. 
Yeah, so when I try to do research on two mountains or stop earthquakes, many with Muslim websites claim, yeah, we have verification, mountains stop earthquakes. And then they refer to another Islamic website. And I go to that other Islamic website, it refers to a third Islamic website. The reality of the matter is... And you is keep, we keep on going know. until there's an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing. The reality of the matter is, do mountains stop earthquakes? There is some research done, especially as late as 2020, indicating that mountains, sea mounts specifically, big sea mountains, might, uh, might, you know, might reduce the magnitude of earthquakes. But there are researches indicating both ways. So we don't know. There is indication that that might be true. But to say that we have verified scientifically that sea mounts or mountains reduce earthquakes, this is not a factually correct statement. The real thing is, as of 2020, from what I have read and from what I have seen of science in scientific papers, the real real status of this event is that we don't know. It doesn't say that mountains don't stop earthquakes. It doesn't even, like, but it doesn't, you know, there is some indication that they might stop earthquakes. But the, But let's be truthful. And it's mm. really very important to be honest. Quran says, yeah. speak the truth even if it, against, if it is against yourself. If I remember correctly, that there's well, a verse. In the, uh, no, very, very, know, very well said that we shouldn't, <laughs> that even if there are certain verses, we shouldn't just, uh, let's not just totally jump to glory. Let's take things yeah. a step at a time. You know, there's going to be things that we're not so sure about, but they're not discredited either. They're just the... It speaks about Allah saying, look, we have placed the these mountains as something uh, the, the verses seem to imply as though something firm. Um, now, one understanding could be that it gives firmness to the to to the ground. Another understanding could be that they in and of themselves have been placed in a firm manner. Um, but if we take the scientific meaning there is no what you're saying is there is no clear cut evidence but still maybe time will tell hmm. yeah what i'm saying is that this particular idea that mountains reduce earthquakes which the verse might you might see as a direct indication from the verse so that it doesn't shake with you so it mm -hmm. says that we made mountains as big so that it doesn't shake with you this clearly indicates that if quran is trying to assert that mountains reduce earthquakes do we know it scientifically we don't the idea is that there is some indication that that might be true, especially for the sea mounts. Uh, as of 2020, there are some papers written, but it's not something that has been established. So we should be very careful in saying there is high probability, but maybe we, we need to do more research on it. Maybe if somebody can get motivated and study geology and work on this as his PhD thesis, write some papers, then maybe we I, uh, next time he will be... Talk and he can say this has been verified. That's Professor, let, let alone reading papers, uh, you're the only person here out of all of these people that is going to be reading papers. Let alone reading papers, we don't, we're not a people who read anymore. <laughs> there's just there's just way too much to watch on, no, on TV. Yeah, I'm not even saying reading, I'm saying writing papers. So be, before somebody, some of these Islamic websites can come up and state that. We have confirmed that mountains cast tape, you, you know, to reduce the magnitude of earthquakes. They need to get up there, do some research for maybe five years, ten years, and then assert that <laughs> if they mm. can prove it. I see. I see. So, so, so very, 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 being very honest, like this is really important be because honest. when you're dishonest, the genuine things are also discredited. When you're being dishonest and you state things that are not true, your genuine things are also discredited. And it's not e difficult in present day for anybody to come up and discredit what you're saying as wrong. I mean, if you make some factual errors, like you might make errors in terms of you not having proper understanding or you missing something up, then people can come up and correct you. But there's one thing that people can see that this person has made a sincere error. And another is that this person had no idea and he's just inventing facts or he's just deliberately misrepresenting. That's a different question altogether. Uh, for, speaking of this, for example, I saw this video somebody, some Christians had made. Huh? Huh? Right. Achha, achha. Um, I thought you were going to tell us about a video you've watched. I was going to say, now everybody can relate. <laughs> yes. So, so apparently, Zakir Naik was talking about evolution, but he was talking about it in a very wrong way and he was rebuked oh, like is, ref is that the them. one where he says that theory that theory of evolution i am a medical yeah. doctor you can take my word <laughs> 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 but anyway like 
you should be very careful in uttering. Like whatever you utter, you should be very sure. And you should not just rely on some, this is again important for all the audience. Don't rely on either, you know, either Islamic websites or websites that are against Islam. Go do your independent research. Try to see if you can come up with something. And then you can say, well, I agree with this point. I don't agree with this point. That is fine. I sometimes disagree with my own points every year, and that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you argue with yourself. <laughs> yeah, well, that, You're like, yeah, yeah, right? don't, don't say it again. I, You're I, like, don't, huh? I wrote a paper with an X point of view, and then after some time, I realized that is wrong, and I write another paper with a Y point of view saying how wrong I was in my first view. But that's a that's the evolution of knowledge. If I do not change wow. any every view, like if at least one of my view doesn't change in a year, then I think I have made no progress in that year. <laughs> wow. Wow. See, take inspiration. People take inspiration <laughs> from professor. Um. So, so that's how you make progress, right? But let's so 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 this is so this is really important. Now, with that, with that, you know, with that, uh, with that uh, formalism of my methodology, like what kind of methodology I am applying, I want to address some specific points which I have actually discussed with Mufti privately. Some of them, uh, <laughs> private, yeah, private yeah, conversations friends. going down. People private talking, <laughs> <laughs> but like, uh, let's come to this thing. Uh, let's come to specifically, you know, there is this, there is this naive way people approach creation of heavens and earth and creation of earth in Quran. They say, well, in one place, Quran says the Quran, God created heavens and earth in six days. In another place, it, when you add up the days, it comes to eight days. What is going on? And some people would say, some people would say, they say, can't God get basic calculus right? Let's now look at what Quran is reading. They go, yeah. they go, well, according to some beliefs that God's only got two fingers, doesn't he, or something. So, you know, according to some of the anthropomorphic kind of humbly views. So, so how many times, how many times can he keep counting on two fingers? <laughs> so we will come to humbly interpretation at the end of it. It's actually humbly interpretation if you want to go to it. If you want to go in detail, it's the humble interpretation actually doesn't say God, like describe God in that way. What they do is they, they associate meaning from language. They say God has two fingers, but we cannot say anything. So then you're not really understanding anything of them. Exactly. So it's a deassociation of meaning and form, then <laughs> making linguistic forms a uh, doer of any meaning. No, I meant so in I think case that's... they thought, in case they thought, you know, like he's counting the days <laughs> on his fingers. And if it's only got two, how many is going to keep I counting? Don't, I don't think even I'm pleased to do that. I don't think I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. Joke, I'm joking, guys. I'm joking, joking, joking. Calm, calm down. Calm down. Okay, let's come to this one. Let's come to this one. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's come to... Okay, first of all, one thing that is very clear from Quran. Like in verse Surah 70, verse 54, God says that I am is 50,000 years. In verse 22, sorry, verse 22, so, sorry, Surah 22, verse 47, it says, I am is 1,000 days. In another Surah 2, verse 185, it says, I am, I am is your normal I am of 24 hours. I am, One thing, I am means days, plural of yom, days, okay. One thing is clear, that the way day or yom is used in Quran, it just signifies a period of time, mm -hmm. not necessarily 24 just any period of time. It yeah. can be 50,000, 10,000, one day, one's lifetime. You can get various examples from within the Quran for this. So I'm not, like for any of my interpretations to be justified, I will justify it from the context of Quran. So this is very important. Mm -hmm. So that people cannot say, where did you get this from? I got it from Quran. So self, say, you know, I'm self-referencing Quran in this. So when you, when you take this idea that Yom is any period of time, it can be thousands of years or days or anything. It could be one billionth of a second or one trillionth of a second. It can be. It's a period of time. Mm -hmm. So period of time. But one thing that was interesting is that rather than a period of time, which has is, which bears some distinction to other periods. Of time. That is what I would say. Now, the first, so let's now take these things about Earth being created in two days, uh, universe being created, heavens and earth being created in six days, seven heavens being created in uh, you know two days, and the spread of uh, resources on Earth occurring in four days. Let's take it one by one. Sure, let's go. And try it. to, you know, I always like breaking things down. Let's break it down and see what is the information being revealed, let's, and then see if that. Let's do accountability. 
वॉट वॉज गॉड डूइंग इन दीज डेज चलो पता लगाए यार के वो क्या रहा था <laughs> let's try to take let's try to take meaning out of these verses cool. so the first thing is earth is created in two days it says that in verse uh, surah 41 verse 9 so two periods let's say two periods earth is created in two periods because we have already uh, established you ayam can mean a period so it, has earth been created in two periods it also says in surah 54 verse 1 that the moon has split and the day of judgment comes near so has moon been split from earth interestingly there what we know now is that there was a proto earth some 4.5 billion years ago and there was another planet called theia and they collided and because of this collision moon split from earth and this occurred for 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 4.5 billion years ago and so the creation of earth occurs in two stages one is pre collision proto earth and then there is the collision with theia moon splits apart and then there is the post collision And so this, yes and this could also refer to the in shaq al qamar that the moon has yeah, split that, that, the split of moon verse 54 surah 54 verse 1 when it says moon was split it never says prophet split the moon that's what tradition says it never says prophet split the moon and in some traditions and it fell on the in the in the garden of hazrat ali abi the that the earth still did not get destroyed somehow <laughs> but, but anyway it just says moon is, like this statement by itself moon has been split is completely correct yes moon was split when theia collided with earth 4.5 billion years ago yes earth has been created in two periods post split pre split two distinct periods so just to be clear for so what we're saying is proto earth so this is the kind of uh the pre earth structure that we know now in which the moon was a part of earth this is what we said yeah so what happened was that there was a there was a proto earth of course there was moon was as a part of the earth this are uh, this proto earth collided with another planet there uh, which is called theia there was a collision and one of that and the debris from that collision formed the moon hmm wow okay i'm not going to details of how sure, we know sure, it that's sure. a lot but sure but, but this, this is, is but this is like, so, this is what we're speaking about is uh, you know this is it's scientific it's not something uh, it's in that science. Mm-hmm. like for example the rock on the moon has the same composition nearly the same composition as rocks on earth with lots of other things so the uh, core of the earth is uh, larger than the leel uh, see when you want the leel professor has got the the leel all right there are lots of this is well established this is pretty much well established interestingly the water from earth came from this planet thea that possibly originated in the outer parts of solar system came oh. and collided with earth as quran says there are rocks which burst to bring out water in surah bakara come to that verse also oh, so subhanallah wa- yes, yes 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 of course wa inna min al ahja ma yatafajjaru minhu al anhar wa inna minha la ma yashaqqu fa yakhruju minhu al ma this is uh, um yeah yeah about about that there are certain rocks but it, it begins about speaking about the heart are like rocks or shaddu qaswa wa inna min al hajarati al ma but some rocks you know rivers will even gush out of them and some will tear open and some water open to bring out water so yeah so thea yeah. did burst out and we got most of our water on earth from thea um, which is interesting but then this let's people might argue that okay the people did not understand it in past this way i understand people did not understand it in past that way but all i can say is that this statement that earth has, moon has been split from mm-hmm. earth let's say from earth is completely 100% correct statement and the statement that earth was created in two periods is a 100% accurate statement okay. whether you want to so that that verse that. right that we're talking about is i mean one of the places that this is uh, you're referring to surah fussilat um that are you verse do you nine. disbelieve yes verse 9 that do you disbelieve in in he or in god who khalaq al arda fi yawmain okay who created the earth in two uh, periods of time okay that's what we're yeah. saying hmm. yeah but then it goes on to say in in the same surah in verse so just 10. to just to be clear you're saying the two periods are first proto earth and then common earth is that is that yeah, what you're saying so there, yes there, there are two distinct periods there's a proto earth pre collision earth and then there's a our earth post collision with moon okay post collision okay well cool we can post <laughs> let's come to this thing that the sec- the ver- surah 41 verse 10 it says uh, 
it says that and i got to got to check he, what verses is yeah, the professor is talking about i'm thinking I'm, I'm thinking yeah, I, I wish i was a computer like that verse 41 number 2 <laughs> yep so carry on professor sorry <laughs> bring it up uh, so surah 41 verse 10 uh, yeah Mm, yeah. So, uh, yep, carry on. Yep, sorry. Yeah. Surah for Surah Silat. Oh, this is for Silat as well. Yep. Surah 41 verse 10. Yeah. Actually, I am reading it from a computer. I don't remember it. <laughs> Zakir Daik. I just listed it. <laughs> okay, so this is to do with the, it begins with the mountains. وَجَعْلَ فِيهَا الرَّوَاسِيَ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا And that they, it had uh, what was kind of stabilized in from above it it mentions wabaraka fiha and he and he blessed it waqaddara fiha and set out in it uh, aqwataha its provisions fi arba'ati ayyam in four days period or four okay, periods okay in four yeah. yes so how many geological eons are there like there is the hadeon which is the first period of earth which is around from 4.5 4. to I mean, 4.6, 4.5 to 4 billion years when Earth is all hot and full of volcanoes and there's very, there's possibly no signs of life or very primitive life. Some might, some people I, uh, have said that there might be very primitive life. There's the Hadean and then there's the Archean uh, where you have primitive life and there then there's the Protozoic period, then there's the Phanerozoic period. These are four periods. So in the first period, Hadean, you have basic uh, Earth is really hot, and the, in Archean, life starts to form, and then in Protozoic period, uh, you okay. have this region coming out, and that destroys the previous life, and then then there's the Cambrian explosion, and then you enter into the Phanerozoic period, which is our current period. What, what, so what is, so what the is it called? Proto. Life, proto. Water. Protolozoic. Lozoic. Protolozoic. Okay. Yep. And Phanerozoic. So, so four periods, and Phanerozoic starts with something called the Cambrian explosion. But whether you like, whether you would argue what this interpretation of this verse would mean, the idea that the life on Earth spread in four different geological eons is yes. a hundred percent accurate mm. statement. There is no doubt about that. I see. Yep. The there pro are, the pro and these are four protozoic protozoic. Uh, yeah. Okay, so professor's not making it up, people. I've just Googled it. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. You can anybody can Google e geological eons. This is pretty straightforward. Mm. Just Google it. Wow. <laughs> you should be doing everything. This is like where you know where I would be using some interpretation. I will tell you where I'm using it. But somebody could. Where say, but somebody could say, look, why do you feel these eons are the four stages in or the four eras or the four eons in which God set out the provisions of the earth? Well, you see, this is what I'm saying that, you know, you might argue whether that these eons would, you know, the, uh, the argument somebody wants to make, he can make that is this what the verse is referring to. But the verse is saying after the creation of earth in two stages, the, the, the distribution of provisions on earth occurred in four stages. This idea that, the, you know, the, the the, uh, the Earth's evolution occurred in four stages is a hundred percent correct idea. Like there is no, th this is something very, mm. well, very. And wow. these are four distinct, and by distinct I mean like water, you know, water is distinct from ice and ice is distinct from vapor. These are different phases. You know? So these are four eons and, th th and this is pretty straightforward. Just Google it up. If I'm in using interpretation, I will tell you where I'm using. I, I will be using some interpretation ahead, but this requires no interpretation. This is the, the idea that the life on Earth evolved in four periods is factually correct. Wow. Hmm. Okay. Yep. Carry on. So but this that's, is yep. So that's still six of the days. Yeah. So so the, but these are now 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 we, if we interpret days as two periods, this is this is a, at a completely different time. Scale. So we are talking of two different phases. First, it is you know creation of Earth, and that's a completely different thing from this. So this is it's, it's so this these are two different you know it's like saying uh, I, I made the house in two stages and then I decorated my room room in four stages. This is completely different scale. These are completely different. I am we are talking about. Ah, 
Fesse, you, that, so that, that analogy we all perfectly understood. <laughs> it's just when you're giving I the other just, analogies about quantum physics, none of us get it. <laughs> no, I think this is more straightforward because it, it talks of well-established, very simple phenomena. It's not more complicated like previous lecture. Okay. So I think I, I this today I hope everybody can understand it. If, if people were finding difficult, like people might have found the previous argument a bit more uh, sophisticated, but this is very straightforward. It is. It is. Um, some of us. Some might might become a bit more complicated, but sorry about that. I can't make it. I can simply try to simplify it as much as possible. But but let's come to the second thing. Let's come to the second. So so this is very important. That period has nothing to do with the other period. So the creation of Earth happening in pre and post collision has nothing to do with these geological eons. This is completely different scale, completely different period. But then it also goes on to say that God created seven heavens in two periods. In verse 41, like Surah 41, verse 12. Okay. Verse 12, yep. Yeah, but before we can even understand what these verses mean, and then it also says he God created Samawat and Earth in six days, like six periods. In, in Surah, say, 7, seven verse 54. But before we can understand this, we need to clarify one thing. What does Samawat mean? Just and I think this... For people, فَقَضَاهُنَّ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ فِي يَوْمَيْنِ وَأَوْحَى فِي كُلِّ سَمَاءٍ أَمْرَهَا Okay, but yep, yeah, carry on. It's the verse that just comes exactly after. We're still in uh, Surah Fusilat. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, uh, so before uh, before we can even discuss what does creation of Samawat in two days or Samawat and Earth in six days mean, we really need to clarify what Samawat means. Okay. And it's interesting. Samawat just means up. So now if I say I'm just talking of up, what am I talking about? I could be talking of my roof. I could be talking of the atmosphere or I could be talking of the universe. Because if I'm putting my coordinate system here and I'm just going up, 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 Depends on how, what scale I am choosing. Yeah. This and that is if I'm just going in this direction. But this, if string theory is true, this is not the only direction. I mean, I'm constrained to move in this direction because I'm made it off of something called open strings, uh, <clears throat> which are like attached to our universe. But gravity can flow out of our universe. But then there are in string theory six extra dimensions, and in and in M theory, from which string theory is proceed, seven extra. Dimensions. So there would be seven other directions that I could have taken. Hmm. So this is very... So... Uh, Those of you that so don't when... know, you see, in string and M theory, there's either 10 or 11 dimensions, not just the, the usual 3D, three dimensions we're used to. Three of space, one of time, and then you have in string, super string, six dimensions, and in M theory, you have seven extra dimensions. But now extra. let's come to that. Hmm. Now that... <laughs> Let's come to this thing. So now when Samawat in Quran, when people would, in, uh, you know, if I'm talking to Arabs, all I could talk about is something above you as Samawat and below you is Arab. But then Samawat could mean, and it means depending on the context, I could be, I, it could mean the atmosphere. It could have a spiritual meaning because again, spiritually high and low. And I, when we come to spiritual meanings, I will give you illustrations from Quran to illustrate this. It could mean our universe. It could mean a multiverse. All of these are possible interpretations. Now, my my reading of Quran says the word Samawat has been used in multiple contexts, in, in all these contexts. Mm -hmm. But when we come to Samawat, Samawat wal Ard, it's a phase, which means some total of everything. It indicates physically our universe. So Samawat can mean spiritual, it can have a spiritual meaning, can mean our atmosphere, can mean the universe can mean multiverse or can mean our universe rooted in a multiverse. No, Samawat wal Ard means specifically our universe because it's in a way of saying everything. Mm -hmm. And everything for us it would mean what is down and what is up, they would understand it as our universe. So it's a so, phase to get So it's a phase to say everything, yeah. But, okay, it's a phase cool. for everything in the context of this universe. So Samawat wal Ard, it does not, I, I don't think it has spiritual meanings, it just means our universe. Mm -hmm. Uh, Saba Samawat means a multiverse, and I'll come to that. And mm. our universe located in the multiverse is called Samawat -e Dunya, the lowest universe, mm. which is fine because if you see in terms of extra dimensions, our universe would be the universe which has 
the which like which has zero which is which is nearest to like which which basically has those extra dimensions when you would go to other extra other universes by moving along those extra dimensions if you are placing your coordinate system in this universe mm-hmm. in a certain sense so there so right are you guys are you guys it. following or oh. <laughs> so let me simplify yeah. it so you could have you could have a multiverse of many universes existing in seven seven different you know directions and these could be many different universes like our universes or even higher dimensional or lower dimensional and they are called samavate sabha samava in this context in which you have many universes our specific universe is called samavate duniya the lowest mm-hmm. and then the heaven and earth is a specific physical term given to our universe and then you have samavat which is a term which can be used for everything now in this context so samavat well earth means our universe sama samavat means the multiverse if you want to make it simple mm-hmm. so so in surah 41 verse 12 god, god is saying that he created sama samavat in two phases mm-hmm. is that true can the multiverse be created in two phases well it goes back to what i was discussing in my previous video that you know now we don't look at it in terms of temporal causation in terms of temporality but in terms of causality <laughs> that we don't look at in terms I've of just seen some of the comments clear is saying that her brain is already frying hang in there don't worry <laughs> okay, okay. and madi ye not in a teasing so we me <laughs> we we don't look at it in terms of time we look at it in terms of causality and in causal mm-hmm. conditions i told you that more fundamental than it is bit so from god would proceed this <laughs> laws of physics this laws of physics would proceed the multiverse mm-hmm. so two stages again from you know first god not first in terms of time but in terms of causation you can look at it as creation of this laws of physics and from those laws of physics because of those laws of physics you have the multiverse something really important okay. he, you know salmon can mean a literal salmon like it talks of salmon in surah ka verse you know surah 18 verse 22 or it can mean metaphorically infinitely many mm-hmm. which is also clarified in quran because in quran no. uh, it says this one in surah 31 verse 27 it says that if the pens were you know if the mm-hmm. trees were pens and oceans were ink the words of god would not be exhausted even if there were seven additional oceans in support of it it is so it does not mean that if you add a eighth ocean the words of god would get exhausted seven here could so seven can be literal but seven can also mean infinitely many hmm. which would fit with the multiverse idea that there are infinitely many universes that is and in, those in, universes... in arabic they did used to use the term seven just to mean so many it's like in english we will say sometimes certain numbers like somebody could say you know just just give me 2 minutes like there's certain numbers that are used like we obviously 100 is used to mean like whoa 100 times i've done this uh even though one could think that 100 isn't that much i mean it is the relative but but in a similar way the arabs had this thing with 7 and also 70 they would use this kind of sometimes 700 this uh th- i mean you guys get the gist of it yeah <laughs> Uh, the way i take it is that in the uh, okay interestingly quran does not only talk of sabha samawat it's in surah 23 verse 17 it talks of seven directions abu you seven paths abu you which of course people in old could have understood as seven orbits because they had this you know uh, yeah, yeah, geocentric model of earth with moon being the first orbit but it literally means seven paths abu you which for me fits very well with this m theory description of seven extra dimensions <laughs> Hmm. Okay. Are you tr- so you're trying to say where it's speaking of sab'a samawat it's speaking of multiverses. Yes, multiverses and where it's speaking we speaking of seven extra dimensions like surah 23 verse 17 it's just talking of seven dimensions because seven as in surah 18 verse 22 can also mean a literal seven. When surah mm-hmm. in surah kahf they say that <laughs> you know the number of that it is just it can be literal seven also it so can, there are seven extra basically dimensions. seven can mean seven but sometimes it can also not mean seven <laughs> yes. just so you guys so, um, get it and, and and i'm not making it up because both of these contexts are clear from within the book. 
<laughs> like in surah kahaf so, salmon means salmon and in uh, in surah 31 verse 27 it means infinitely many uh, yes. so in the same way i think there are infinitely many multiverses universes in seven extra dimensions and in surah 23 verse 17 quran clearly states abo you are seven paths which fits very well with them mm-hmm. yeah and it's okay. really interesting because also look at the views of verse seven here because in that time they would have in- easily understood it as their own model of you know geocentric universe and you can so you can have this dualistic reading also mm-hmm. so quran doesn't seem strange to them or to us sure so but you know yeah go on no no i was just going to say that somebody has asked here that um the creation of the earth in 6 days then we've already you've already concluded on that yeah, haven't you so we'll come to creation of earth in 6 oh, days separately oh. but let's come okay. to We'll I thought we'd, I thought we'd concluded that you know for me no, no, no. past present, present future is just part. it's just an illusion yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so that this is multiverse so so but here i want to clarify one more thing that if you look at those old geocentric models of the earth and this goes back to leaving hints in the quran that that is not true of course people in that time and i i would guess most scholars in that time would have understood when quran refers to seven directions abu you or seven some samawat it's talking of those seven orbits of planets but there is a hint in in quran only that it's not true you know what is the hint the hint is that in all those models of geocentricity the stars lie in the low, highest heaven but quran says here stars lie in the lowest heaven mm-hmm. samawat hai duniya and in all yeah, my yeah, research yeah. in no cosmic cosmology do the stars lie in the lowest heaven that would not make sense for them because stars for them this when they looked at it from earth from their perspective star look fixed so they were thinking that these are orbits and above that there is a fixed structure of you know stars see, so in none of and it said cosmologies does it say that stars lie in the lowest heavens so this is a hint like they were, and this hint is so subtle they did not yeah, get because it in the, no, because in the, the quran it mentions sama dunya that the the lowest of the sky that or the the heavens allah has made the stars or placed the stars in them so okay and that doesn't actually correspond with any uh given kind of cosmology that existed Yes so that so but you see the, the this is this is how the this is what i mean by dual reading it says seven so seven could mean direction seven and we we would understand 23 verse 17 as seven different directions in this extra multiverse and then seven universes samas as multi universes based of, on the structure of quran but they did not need to be this sophisticated they would just say oh this just means our old knowledge of you know planets seven planets like that time the planets that were moon known and moon is in the first orbit this mo- but quran leaves a subtle hint that this is not correct by saying that stars are in the lowest heaven wow. and it goes on to say Wow, so this professor, is like that's an amazing like, profound like, thought i never thought of that before va wow. wow. like quran <laughs> and this quote only got you know in decoded at our time because this required some sophisticated thought which i don't think people in the past <laughs> and, i mean to be fair i think they did have sophisticated thought just obviously <laughs> knowledge has developed that sort <laughs> <laughs> not to just write off and cancel all their thought processes <laughs> hmm you see so it's that same verse faqadahunna sab'a samawatin fi yawmayn that allah uh, set out the seven heavens in these in two days wa awha fi kulli sama'in amraha and each matter or affair was uh dictated or inspired to each heaven was zayyan as-sama'a dunya and the lowest of the heavens was then decorated bi masabih with these lamps which is speaking about the stars obviously mhm that's uh, surah this- surah fussilat verse 12 mhm what is beautiful is in that this is this is a subtle hint in quran that that geocentric model is not correct but wow. but then also this idea wow. that as a solid that, point you know in, professor you're doing it you're doing it <laughs> and then there is this thing that in every sama there is its amr like every universe has its law this is the modern idea of multiverse that every universe comes with its own variant of this 
this so, is what, so you, just to be clear it's saying let's say in in a different universe the laws of gravity might operate differently is this what we're saying or what the in, in a different universe the fundamental constants of nature might be different there might be completely new forces the, you, the, 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 oh. there, there are even models in which you could have multiverse with two directions of time there are models possible like that so you could have two directions of time you could have something like one dimensional universes you could have seven dimensional universes you could have anything wow bloody hell <laughs> i think uh, <laughs> we need to be sober more sober for <laughs> for for maximizing our benefit from professor yep so okay wow well oh and obviously this verse wa oh hafi kulli samain amraha and in each heaven or each dimension universe its matter or its affair or its law was was kind of uh, inspired or given mm -hmm. yeah so each so so we have in <laughs> principle 10 or dimensions four of them are visible and some of the the remaining seven are extra and in each of these dimensions we have these multi universes like many sheets of paper on a you know you in in the in, in on along the height you can imagine it something like that and then each of these universe can have different laws this is something very 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 like this is something again i would not say it's established the way that eon thing is established for earth being in four pieces this is not something that is established the creation of multiverse or many universes happening in two periods might be because you can even argue about it in a different way but i believe that discussion to aside but the fact that there is a multiverse it's it's highly possible but not established so again being mm. truthful for your students fa and your, again your knowledge is only matched by your truthfulness professor thank you again <laughs> <laughs> i'm an expert honest about it it's highly possible if string theory is true but, or, or even if string theory is not true there are other models in which you can have these extra dimensions but uh, somebody somebody is asking what is the difference between the multiverse theory and david lewis's actualist possible worlds theory i'm not sure if you well, many multiverse theory is just nonsense i have again spoken against it i i support copenhagen interpretation i spoke i support the actual, actual objective reduction and uh, reductionist approach to um, wave function but we will we will deviate from the to topic Fair i'm enough. completely against interpretation many world interpretation says if i lift this cup i drop it down the universe splits into two in which i have in one universe i have done it in one i have not done it oh. i do not support this oh, this is right nonsense right. there was an article many written world... by some some uh, it was actually a young boy uh, positing that when the lhc was trying out the experiments that what they did is they completely destroyed the universe <laughs> but we just carried on in a different universe I don't know if you came across that. It was in the newspapers. Yeah, when LHC was doing this experiment 2015, um, me and some of my friends did certain calculations about uh, creation of mini black holes by which we can detect, uh, of course, these extra you know, dimension, extra you like these parallel universes. And then just because our research was published few days before LHC started operating, there was a huge like every so so many newspapers quoted it. And if you Google my name, you will still get this LHC parallel universe. And then people extrapolated it to weird. you know we are the it's a, it's a different world people this is a different world that professor lives in i'm telling you <laughs> but so, uh, so, yeah. go on sorry no no carry on carry on you were saying uh, so we don't uh, deviate from the topic uh you're yeah. speaking so, about yeah creation of heavens and earth so i said saba samawat means many multiverse uh, but samawate wal earth just means our universe and samawat can mean our universe all or or it can also mean it can have a spiritual meaning or it can mean atmosphere depending on the context because it just means up and if you go up of course you can say the roof is up the atmosphere is up and if you are go if you're sending the rocket out of our solar system and what it is i mean isn't just out, out of curiosity yeah. isn't just up down and all these things just relative anyway because to up to but us it, is here but because space doesn't really is not within a greater space so what is up what is that i mean for all we know it could be this way up for us, like up for me in australia this would be down and yes exactly. but i'm saying that you know if i 
if I just want to describe, if I want to send a rocket, if I base my coordinate system here and I want to gain information, the simplest way I could say is, well, the atmosphere is above me. It doesn't mean that on the other side of Earth, there is not atmosphere below me. It just means this is how I would mm -hmm. gain information about the atmosphere. In the same way, I could talk like this is our, again, linguistic way of talking about it. And mm -hmm. of course, mathematically, of course, of course. Uh, no, I'm with you, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is this is very simple way of talking uh, in terms of again in up up and down in terms of these extra dimensions um, yes you know when you want to go if if you imagine this is our universe and, ex and this is an extra dimension so the a second universe would be lower like our universe would be the lowest with, with extra dimensions set equal to zero and for a finite value of extra dimensions you would go to the are, other are you are you envisaging universes on top of each other stacked up is this how that Actually, the, that is called brain bulk model. You have a 10-dimensional bulk, and then you have brain, many brains, which might be parallel to each other. And one of the ways universes can be created is by these brains colliding with each other. I'll come to that when I come to the creation of universe. <laughs> but there's a lot it's amazing. Let's come, let's stick to the topic because of there's course, so much of, course, of information. Of yeah, and I'm very bad at organizing it. <laughs> so let's come to the second part of it. Quran also says God created heavens and earth in six ayam. Mm -hmm. Six days, people. Yeah. Six. So, so, the, so we know 100% the earth is created in two periods. The, there are four geological eras. And for multiverse, there could be two, you know, causally two periods. What about our physical, our universe? Now, specifically our universe, because I said Samawat well, earth just means our universe in, in the context of Quran. Is our universe created in six periods? This is a question. Again, I want to stress that these periods have nothing to do with the periods in which seven universe, like multiverse is created. That's a completely different scale we are talking about. We are not talking about the period at which Earth is created, a completely different scale. Hmm. But is it true that our universe, the universe we occupy, is created in six periods? Is it true? So I'll tell you now some interesting information about our universe, which will be interesting to you. Like there are Ev everything you're yeah. telling us is interesting, Professor. Everything you're telling us is interesting. <laughs> so, so there are you could classify the age of universe based on what you could say whether what what kind of physics is operating in the universe, and then there would be different phases where you had different physics, and these phases would be like uh, the analogy I can give you is that. Water has a different behavior from ice, and ice has a different behavior from vapor, or they're called different phases. So, so, so does our universe have phases in its cosmological evolution? The idea answer is yes. So, based on the physics, okay, okay. what, how many phases? Do we have? I will not again uh, talk about each of these phases because that will, like, I want to cover a lot more material today, hopefully. <laughs> uh, and, so hold on, I, hold on I, to I, your I, brains, people. Hold on to your brains. I, 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 like there are four fundamental forces, right? So in the beginning, all the four forces operate together in the Planckian epoch. And this, these epochs are, by the way, not like, you know, when we are talking of now phases, what time scales are we talking about? 10 to the power minus 43 seconds. That is 0 0.004301 seconds. That's when the phase, this phase exists. But in, these, in that phase, all the four forces act together. So the Planck epoch, when all the four forces Act by the four then forces, there a, we're talking about the fundamental forces of like gravity yeah, and electromagnetism and magnetism, strong, strong force, weak, weak and force. <laughs> <laughs> you think I don't know the four forces, people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so, so we have we have all the four forces acting together in the Planck epoch, first epoch. The first force to separate out is gravity in the grand unified theory epoch, second epoch, which is around 10 to the power minus 36 seconds. The third force to separate out is the strong force. Okay. And we come to the electro. And then we have the electro weak force splitting out. So this is already four different phases of our universe. Then we again might need a fifth phase because you know there are many things in our universe we don't understand. For example, why is matter there more matter than antimatter? The, the theory for that is uh, called uh, baryogenesis, and then we. We don't know why there's dark matter, so a possible solution to that is supersymmetry, which we have not again confirmed. There are strong constraints on, on that from LHC. There are many different models for this. So this fifth phase is not understood. How does so so universe clearly has these four phases, and then a possible fifth phase in which you know all these physics 
come uh, like so these mysteries get solved and we come to the present physics so six different phases of six different physical phases so, the, so just to be clear so you've got the four forces the four those four phases you're saying the fifth is matter it is dealing with things like dark matter antimatter yeah. that kind of stuff dark energy <laughs> Not dark, energy, dark not, energy, dark not dark energy, gravity. Not dark energy. Not dark energy, people. Just dark <laughs> matter. <laughs> and not only dark matter, predominance of matter over antimatter. So this all can happen in a another phase transition, if you like. Uh, dark, and dark, if, hashtag if it's like super symmetry, dark lives. If, <laughs> if supersymmetry is true, this is pretty straightforward. But if it is not true, we have other models also. So we don't understand the fifth phase, to be all, in all honesty. Okay, sure. And then we have the present phase. So this is based on the physics of our universe. Mm -hmm. You could also argue that let's not look at physics. Let's look at the rate of expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. Again, you would have a pre-inflationary state. Then there is a rapid expansion, the inflation. Mm -hmm. And then there is the radiation-dominated era, which ends around 47,000 years after Big Bang. And then there is the matter-dominated era. And then around 9.8 .8 billion years ago, we enter into the dark energy-dominated era. And in far future, we will enter into the, you know, the far future where the physics are like slightly different, rather mm -hmm. completely different. So, what you're, so saying, again, six, six. what you're saying is you could take a different paradigm and it still has these six stages. Six. And, and 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 you could take a different thing and say, well, let me look at what conscious, like what is the like what's the construction of like what are the particles that the universe that dominate the universe, the mass of the universe. Mm -hmm. So you would start with pre-standard model particles, which would be existing in the first phase. Then then you would have the quark epoch around twelve minus twelve seconds. And then you would have these quarks would mix into like join together to form the hadrons around 10 to the power minus six seconds. So you would have the pre-standard pre model epoch, the quark epoch, the hadron epoch, and then you would have something called lepton epoch. And then you would have, again, you know, you would have photon epoch. And then, then you would have, um, and then you would have our formation of neutral matter. So again, six epochs. So you still have like, them, and again, I would be honest here, unlike Earth's, you know, when I talked about Earth, which was pretty straightforward, mm -hmm. two stages, 100%. And when I said um, geological ages, 400%. And when I said multiverse, again, it's a bit of interpretation, but very certain that you can think bit and then it. Here, you know, it's because we don't understand many of these phases. So I would be, in all honesty, I would say that based on three different ways of classifying the age of the universe, it is highly, like, it's, it, it's, Convenient to classify it in six different epochs. There, there, there seem to be six different epochs. But again, we do not have certainty because we have not seen supersymmetry. We don't understand these things very really well. It's the lack of our knowledge that uh, that makes me say that there. It is highly likely that the evolution of our universe occurred in six different epochs, and that is based on six, two, three different ways of classifying the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. But you know, on honestly, again, I will be honest here. I won't put it like you remember when I talk, talked about geological eras. I said hundred percent certain. I would not use those words mm -hmm. because, for example, take inflation. There, somebody had written a paper that inflation can occur in two stages. I mean, these things are not really well understood. At least. There are many wow. competing theories here. But in all honest, like in all honesty, it seems highly likely. Like you had the four splits of four forces, and then the possibly need a fifth one and so six seems to be the most natural classification fair enough so what we're saying is yeah. that this is a very um the the classification given in the quran of ayam of six days is something that seems to fit very nicely to our current understanding even if we change it depending on what we're looking at whether we're looking at the forces and other things or whether we're looking at uh, matter in and of itself how that formed many of these expansion. things seem to have been given six different formations that's what we're saying mm. yes now look at this again we come to this dual reading of quran when people in the past would have read six ayam they would have related it to the genesis six days yeah and 
But again, I told you, Quran has this subtle code that has to be deciphered. But Quran just showed you that this is not six because it gave also the evolution of Earth separately and it discussed the creation of multiverse separately. So when people would naively add, they would not add two plus two plus two plus two plus four is eight. It can't be six. So if it is not six, there is some, it's not the Genesis description. There is something else. And But this again required sophistication, which people in the past did not have. I would say, and we have it as we that, that, that they can't. I'm sure they had sophistication, but a different one type. But yes, of course. <laughs> so what 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 you're saying is that you see they wouldn't have understood this to mean eight uh, because they already had that Genesis backdrop of saying, well, six days. So when God says He created the world in six days, they already knew that so in the other verses when people are adding up the separate and saying two plus four plus two oh this equals eight now that's not how they would have understood it that's what you're saying yeah yes and then, so they would be wondering what happens here so now what we understand is that the first verse when it talks of creation of earth it's a different scale distribution of earth different scale multiverse a completely different scale and creation of heavens and earth by that meaning the creation of universe, a completely different scale. These are different scales, different phenomena, but the division seems to be correct. And interestingly, mm. if you want to be naive and read it as, as a Genesis narrative, you can do that. And I guess in past people might have done that. So again, you come to this dual reading of Quran. Look at the beauty of the structure. This amazes me. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> I, I keep getting amazed by Quran all the time. But Ashraf. let's come to something more. Like, I really want to finish this before you fall asleep <laughs> <laughs> i did tell professor i said you know what i said having for so many years lived a vampire lifestyle this past over a week i've changed my lifestyle just trying it out so i'm trying to live like a normal person and i did say that <laughs> i hope i don't fall asleep during your because <laughs> it'll just be so embarrassing if i'm like <laughs> sorry carry on carry on professor <laughs> So, 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 Mufti, let's come to now something. Like, this is about days. Let's come to what Quran really speaks about. Well, like, I, I, I want to come to the spiritual interpretation of Samawat, which is important. But before that, I want to briefly touch on what does Quran talk, uh, what does Quran say about cosmology as such? What does the Quran say specifically about our universe? Well, you know what Quran specifically says about our universe. Uh, many, many Muslim, uh, many Muslims have interpreted verse twenty one. Surah 21 verse 30 as Big Bang, when it says uh, the heavens and earth were joined together and we clothed them as slander and we brought everything out of water, will they not then believe? Uh, this, well, like here, if, if we interpret heavens and earth as, as a phase, meaning everything, that's pretty accurate because that would just mean everything in our universe, everything in our universe, not everything in the multiverse, everything specific to our universe, which would make, which would be fine because it would just mean that everything in our universe was together and and then it in, in, it was glowed as slander. Many people have said, well, there was no bang in the sense, so the big bang was not a bang. But again, I like to break things down. What do you mean when there is an explosion or a bang? You know, ex explosion. What is explosion? It's something that you know, you have, something like a bomb is. All the substance is in a very you know comp is um, compressed together, and mm -hmm. in a very small amount of time, it has a rapid expansion and the explosion. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by bang. We don't mean sound by bang. We just, this is, you know, you, you could in principle oh, think okay. of a bang without in space, for example. There would, yeah. If there's no air, there would be no sound. But yeah, there the wouldn't bang be sound. Longer. And arguably, yeah, philosoph they philosophically, they, one could argue if there was no ear to hear it, then how could there be sound? Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the waves would be there. But interestingly, what we mean by blow them asunder, blow them apart, is the fact that something which is held together in a very small area sudden undergoes a sudden expansion. That is what inflation, what happened to universe during inflation. Universe, mm -hmm. we, we know universe was in a very small, you know, uh, volume and it went, to, it, it, there was an inflation and it, we, there was a rapid expansion. So that's pretty, that's pretty accurate. That's, but people have already highlighted it. So nothing new yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I'm just uh, trying to answer to people who say, "Well, it's not, it's not an explosion." Nobody is saying that there was a, like it, it was an explosion, like a dynamite. <laughs> and then they say, "Why? How come heavens and earth?" Well, we, you know, heavens and earth is just a phase, meaning everything. Uh, 
Quran says again in Surah 51, verse 47, we are expanding the universe. We have created the heavens with power and we are expanding them. Expansion of universe is pretty well understood. Something that, again, nothing, I don't want, I have nothing to add here, but I have something to add in verse 21, Surah 21, to verse add, 100. To add two verse. <laughs> no, to add to uh, our we understanding. Thought, we thought, Chalo, <laughs> Allah did most of it and the rest Professor will add. <laughs> <laughs> Allah, no, I, Allah I just, says, Chalo, okay, since you're at it, you might as well add to the universe as well. So, let, so let, let us, you know, God does everything, you know. So let's come to verse, verse Surah 21, verse 104. Surah 21, verse 104. It's a very interesting surah. Acha? Acha? Chalo, let's find out. <laughs> yeah. No, what did you say? Verse... Oh, no, go on. What did you say, sorry? Surah? Surah 21, verse 104. The day we shall roll up the heavens. Oh, right. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. carry, yep, carry on, sorry. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, this verse actually talks of... God, it says the day we shall roll up the heavens and we shall create a new creation the way we created the first. Mm -hmm. Approximate meaning of the verse. Yeah. Now... This is very interesting because in and a way, if you see... People, يَوْمَ نَطْوِ السَّمَاءِ قَطَيِّ السِّجِلِ Okay. قَطَيِّ السِّجِلِ لِلْكُتُبِ كَمَا بَدَأْنَا أَوَّلَ خَلْقٍ نُعِيدُهُ وَعْدًا عَلَيْنَا إِنَّا كُنَّا فَاعِلِينَ Okay. Well, yep. This, Carry on, yeah. Sorry. This requires some discussion. So I will do some discussion here before going ahead. So the discussion that it requires is this. That it talks of you know what it so, so clearly it talks of contraction of the universe because you know the way universe is expanding and it's like a scroll opening and then in a way metaphorically speaking contraction would be like you know everything the scroll going back in you know the winding up the un yeah. universe being contracting and that's but surah, stop um, anybody if they're checking a surah ambiya that is let me just repeat the number for you guys i uh, what was it? Yep, one o four. Okay, Surah twenty one, verse one o four. Yep, carry on. Sorry. Yeah. So it says that you sh we shall create a new creation the way we created the first. So it's talking of another universe being created from that debris. Of this universe. Now there is some amount of discussion needed here. People can like this is almost obvious that you can see in at least for me when I see it from a modern context, I can see it obviously that this is talking of contraction of universe and then re-expansion, mm -hmm. but. What are the scientific evidences of our universe contracting back? This is an important question. What is the scientific evidence? As in that our contract, uni the universe contracting it's again. It's expanding right now. It's expanding currently, expanding. but we're speaking about it coming back, contracting. Coming back and then bouncing off to create a new universe. So, and this is how our universe also was created. We shall create a new creation the way we created our first. So our universe yeah. was created from a, Come on, a cyclic knowledge. So our universe was created this way, and then the future universe will also be created this way. So what um, is the okay. what are the well, like? Okay, if you look at if you neglect all the quantum effects, and that is what I think there was even an article written against. When he said, "Oh, this verse is not scientific because if you see right now, universe is undergoing an accelerated expansion, and if it accel if it undergoes this expansion, it will never contract." That's what the article had said. But that is only true if you neglect the quantum effects. If you neglect the quantum effects, that universe is undergoing con uh, currently an accelerated expansion. When you say quantum, it, when you say quantum effects, what 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 do you mean by quantum effects? Effects from quantum gravity, because you see, one of the things is that again, as I told you last time in my lecture, we don't know quantum gravity, but we have many approaches <laughs> to quantum gravity. And many of these approaches suggest, like loop quantum gravity suggests, again, the universe will contract, reach a minimum volume, but in, in your loop quantum gravity, there's a minimum volume, it will expand back onto itself. In string theory, you have these parallel brains, they, can't, they can, you could collide, which will cause a contraction of everything, and then another big bang for each of these brains, and they will go apart. And there are many models of quantum gravity where the uni current accelerated state of expansion is just one of the states, and you will have other states where the universe will contract back itself on itself and then bounce into a new universe, 100% fitting this description that we, it, it, the universe will contract back on itself and create a new universe. And this is how the first universe has been created. 
Is it 100% verified? No, because we don't have a verified theory of quantum gravity. Is it likely? Very, very likely. In fact, one of the papers that I can't stop talking about here, one of the th papers that I did last, I think, two, <laughs> three years ago, Okay. That I said, okay, we don't know quantum gravity, but we know from quantum gravity that space time has a minimum length to it. Let's just take this this information and throw it in, you know, throw it in the cosmological evolution. Thank you. Thank you. Like, like, like <laughs> let, let, let's just put this this additional information in. We had a very nice way of doing it. We used something called thermodynamical approach to relativity, um, but we, we we had a very interesting way of doing that. But what we show, we, what we were able to demonstrate is that there are four distinct phases of our universe. So it's currently accelerating, then it will deaccelerate, and then you know it's accelerating in its expansion, then it will deaccelerate in its expansion. And these are like four cyclic phases, and it does fit with this model that, you, you, in simple words, the universe is accelerating, it will come back, and then it will form another universe. And this, we just use the fact that you space time as a minimum length. Uh, which which is which seems to be a prediction from all models of quantum gravity but independently in other models of quantum gravity this can be shown so highly likely not verified because we don't have a quantum theory of gravity but like you know this is what amazes me this is so sophisticated seriously this is like i can't imagine people in the past even i don't know how they got their head around this what no, they would say i mean so you see this kind of a verse yawma natwis sama katiyas sijilli lil kutub and then it, it mentions that how we began the first creation we will repeat it i guess they probably just saw it very kind of uh, illustratively in in a in a kind of like a uh, glory majestic sense of god kind of wrapping up in his hand almost the whole uh you know universe and but yeah i mean th th probably just as a picture a picturesque this kind of imagery this thing but today because it's contraction like it's like the acceleration and deacceleration in three dimensions it's like if one day I will, hopefully we'll i'll expand on it with you one of these days i'll tell you each point needs a lot more explanation <laughs> because this is so hard to pictureize as i'm talking to you in language because i usually think in mathematics i am seeing how hard it is for do, me to convey these you, things do you, do you do you th do you think do you think in mathematics is that is that how yes, you think that's how I so how that's why just on a tangential note, what, what, give us an example of how you what, what, like when you're thinking you you're like, seeing mathematic I, I formulas see, and yeah I can see, I can see things mathematically like state A plus state B gives you state C I can see these oh this is the wave function I don't need to pictureize a place I can I can think of universe being created in an abstract mathematical configurational space I'm fine with that okay so you, so you're seeing like formulas is, is, is that how you see yeah it? like yeah, but they have real existence for me the way oh yeah you see like imagine so, we so thought like I, that I, I can see like how difficult it is to convey this in language but like the closest beautiful the only beautiful language i can think about it is is the way quran has illustrated it in these few beautiful words i can't like i'm finding it hard to uh, explain these words and it can't be explained beautiful, more beautifully. That's the way we shall roll. That's shall roll because you're, the heavens, the you're seeing it in up. mathematic equations, and we're all like, we're all kind of bottom set maths. We're like still <laughs> using the the kind of calculus thing, like moving the beads, oh, three fingers, four. <laughs> oh, but there's six and six, but there's only ten fingers. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 come to let's go but you can see the beauty here this is so beautiful no it's, uh, it sounds i, I mean uh, you you're obviously giving so much information but it sounds amazing it sounds amazing but let's come to like i'm trying to finish uh, you know finish the samavad because i want to touch on evolution and alien thing also like if i get time uh like before mufti falls asleep <laughs> <laughs> My brain's already melted, but it's good. It's good. Uh, it's 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 being yeah, trained. So, so another tree, another uh, another use of you know heavens as an atmosphere would be verse twenty three, Surah twenty. Sorry, Surah twenty three, verse eighteen, where it clearly means atmosphere. So that is so apart. So apart from meaning our universe in as in Samawat Wal Ard mm -hmm. or just Samawat. It, it, or meaning the multiverse as Sabha Samawat and our universe situated in multiverse is always called the lower heaven, which is also a quote to show that 
there is there is no the geocentric model of earth is not correct uh, it, the, the universe the word samavat is also used for atmosphere which is fine because you know if you send a rocket the first thing it will touch is uh, i mean of course we are all living in atmosphere but then you would get to different layers of atmosphere and then leave our solar system and then our galaxy and if it's traveling faster than light hopefully the object will be visible and then if it you know if it is made up of purely like if you can the only thing that can leave our universe in a multiverse sense is gravity the other forces are constrained to be in our universe but separate matter <laughs> gravity can leave our universe yeah yeah that the, that's an explanation for why it's so weak brain bulk models will come to that okay. <laughs> one day but even okay <laughs> even though isn't gravity just a curvature of space time oh, <laughs> <interesting. laughs> thought i don't know gravity. that point the, the fluctuation of gravity the gravitons we talk about in string theory mm -hmm. the small fluctuations that i talked about are can be represented by something called closed strings so they are like this they are not attached to the universe they can even go from something called brain brain into bulk whereas the other particles are replaced are represented by open strings which are like this and attached to our universe with their hands <laughs> and they can you know, so we can't even leave our universe uh -huh. pretty straight let's come to pretty, this let's that come part to... was just pretty straightforward <laughs> Let's look at this. So, so in Surah 23, verse 18, you you know God talks of sama as as the atmosphere, and but that's fine. Like that, but you know this usage of sama should not be confused with the universe when it's talking of the universe, and universe who should not be con confused with multiverse. It is this con. It's this so multi what, usage. So what we're saying is that in the Quran, the term sama, which could which means i guess it's, it's translated as sky heavens uh, above the, uh, as in cosmologically above not just like above me but like up there beyond above so what we're saying is that these words have to be understood by their context um yeah, yeah so it can mean either of these differently at different times it can mean universe as well at certain times yes mm -hmm. yeah but it it can have one more meaning and this is a meaning that many people get confused about you see a central theme in quran is that quran uses physical phenomena for as a spiritual metaphor and that is throughout quran physical but does, phenomena for a spiritual a, matter okay but that's a structure in quran summun bukmunum you know if you take it literally it just means deaf dumb blind but here you can see that quran is using physical you know <laughs> physical summun bukmunum people might say why is allah speaking about disabled people <laughs> but it's not it's not it's not a phys, it's, it's not, not it's, it's metaphorical it's, it's metaphorical yeah so that's the whole thing it's not physical it's metaphorical mm -hmm. so the idea is that you know the, but the idea is that you know this this metaphor has its root in 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 some physical phenomena and that's how that's how language works that's how language works but you know the verse you mentioned about rock about surah 224 mm -hmm. now there is something really interesting about this verse if you see what what the structure here it says there are rocks which break out or which you know which burst out to bring out what which burst to bring out water which is both physically true as well as metaphysically true because physically i told you water from my earth came, up, came from thea when thea collided with earth but that's also metaphysically true because you know sometimes if you have hard hearted and you you cry and then you might you know that might soften your heart so it's physically true metaphysically true yeah so, but then but so then it goes the on verse that we're speaking about is in surah baqara that thumma qasat qulubuhum min thumma qasat qulubukum min ba'd dhalika fa hiya kal hijara that the hearts had hardened or your heart Allah is addressing them had become hardened so it, they are like stone or ashaddu qaswa or more severe wa inna min al hijarati lama yatafajjaru min al anhar that there are certain rocks from which rivers kind of burst forth and there are certain stones which will kind of break apart and water emerges from them and some which drop uh, from the um, consciousness of Allah or realization of Allah but yeah sorry carry on
So this is really beautiful because what this verse does is see, the first part of it is both physically true and metaphysically true. There are stones which break out, to, which glow a slender to bring, you know, to uh, which glow a slender and water comes from them. Yeah, Kia collided with earth and water came from that. That's both physically true and metaphysically true because mm -hmm. you might cry and you're often but the second part the la, 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 sorry the last part of the verse when it says they you know they fall down because of the for god consciousness that part is only metaphysical so it takes some so, physical mm. phenomena draws met, one to one metaphysical analogies but then describes a metaphysical phenomena which is purely metaphysical you cannot trace it back and draw something draw a physical analogy for this. Mm -hmm. so this I is see. a structure which is repeated in Quran, Quran over and over again and again, at least the way I feel. Uh, that there are physical phenomena which are used as spiritual metaphors. So the question is, is the word Sama also used as a spiritual metaphor? The idea for that is yes. Sama is used as a spiritual metaphor. And you, you can see that here, where, where when it talks of, you, you know, we will open the gates of heavens. Uh, and they will climb thereof, and they will still not accept it. So it's not talking of physical heavens thereof. Mm -hmm. There are no physical. It's talking that even if these people have spiritual experiences, they will still not accept it. If they are mm -hmm. so bound on accepting the truth, that they might not even accept their own spiritual experiences. But so clearly, Quran is talking about sama in terms of a, as a spiritual metaphor. But I like one particular, I mean, I like everything in the Quran, but one thing that really strikes me is this particular usage of Samai Dunya, the lowest heaven. If you look at it, in terms, and then there being stars in the lowest heaven. Now, if you look at it, there are, star, physically, there are stars in our universe, that's fine. But if you look at a metaphysical interpretation of this verse, if you look at world civilizations, mm -hmm. Confucius in China talks of Shende at Tayan, uh, Tayan. Uh, Zoroastra in Iran talks of Ehro Mazda. Uh, you know, yeah. in India we have the tradition of Ishwar and Brahman. Uh, in, you know, in, in Semitic traditions we have the in Christianity we have God the Heavenly Father, and in Islam of course we have Allah, and in Judaism we have Yahuwah. It's like the, if you see world civilization, they are, they stand on the banks of these, on the back of these people who are like stars and who have been talking about divine and doing of good. But this is the lowest realization. In Sufi sense, this would be the lowest realization. This would be the lowest structure. The apparent law, apparent you know, moral structure of the world lies on the banks, on the back of these great shining stars, which we call prophets. And they are quotes, they are scattered throughout human history. And if there are aliens, of course, there are aliens. I would expect something similar for them. But uh, you know, the, all the world civilizations had their uh, their own. Uh, share of prophets, be it Ram or Christian, be it Confucius, be it Zoroastra, be it Jesus, be it Moses, be it Muhammad. It, like the world civilization is spammed by them. Like all of it, like, uh, spam in this vector sense of covering all the vector very fields. So the uh, so the whole world's uh, not in this male sense of spam I'm using, but like the world civil civilizations are covered. By them. But this is the lowest of the spiritual realm. And then there are higher realms of spirituality. I think in Buddhism, you have these seven realms of spiritual uh, enlightenment. Some work should be done on that if the Quran is talking of that. But then I, what I find interesting here is that it also says these stars are used as missiles. As mis the Shaya. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. It can't be talking of physical stars being used as physical missiles against a physical shayati. <laughs> that would be strange. But it is definitely <laughs> like, like, just like... You know, just like the rocks break down because of fear, like uh, God consciousness, here the verse now shifts to a totally metaphysical usage. And in, in a way, this is true because you see what happens is that uh, world, in world, if you see, there are prophetic systems that have been established. Mm -hmm. There are these great people who have come throughout world civilization and they have geared the world civilization towards morality. But then these these uh, these structures in course of time have got corrupted. And when they have got corrupted, a new star comes and hits these corrupted shayateen in a certain, in a nice way. And shayateen here means people. Like, like the system of Moses had got corrupted by Pharisees. Jesus came as this burning star and hit them. You can look at it in this way. 
and the idea that you you can use shayateen for people is also clear from quran itself because quran says i think in where does it say in surah bakara that when they go back to their shayateen here it's not referring to yeah. uh, you know i mean the quran <laughs> clearly does use the term shayateen to mean human beings it does like you know it says uh, clearly i mean it uses that in several locations yep yeah, yeah. yeah so so uh, so in this sense the way i would look at it is that the world the, the moral structure of world the moral structure of world civilizations stands because of these bright uh, star like human beings be they ram krishna be it confucius be it zoroastra be it jesus be it muhammad who drive these civilization to moral truths and then if if these systems get corrupted for example the jewish even though judaism is a great religion with all due respect and love for judaism that i have mm, uh, it, 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 because of pharisees it had got corrupted jesus came as a burning star and hit those pharisees and brought back the spiritual message of tawra and became a walking tawra himself so what what you're saying is these verses to do with uh, you know like rujum al shayateen that these are a kind of like a, a stoning or shuhab they they like flames that attack the shayateen uh is is it it's allegorical in the sense that it's a metaphor for these luminary personalities and figures throughout history like zarathustra other people prophets uh people like buddha but also jesus moses the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam these are these bright stars that allah says wa laqad zayyana samaa ad-dunya bi masabih wa ja'alna harjuman lish shayatin this yeah okay mm. especially especially people like confucius ram krishan uh, zoroastra jesus muhammad i think for my understanding of buddhism buddha was a mystic but not a prophet but we'll come to those distinctions some day when we discuss the differences between them but Zoroastra clearly was a prophet. Confucius clearly was a prophet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, anybody who has studied a bit of Chinese religion knows Tian and Shande are, are all like when Quran was translated into Chinese, Tian Tian was used for God, and Shande is clearly yeah. a, doesn't have age. But so, that's yeah, interesting clearly, because isn't I'm pretty sure that isn't Tian is also for sky as well, like the. But it's in this abstract sense, yeah. in, not mm-hmm. in a literal. Uh, mm. because tian has a will so it's it's this idea of brahman in hinduism it's very similar mm. to that because tian has a will and it's identified with shinde which is which means the high lord if i remember correctly but which has this uh, idea of you know a god because if it's not this abstract mm. idea of you know an abstract uh, in person because confucius says i am implementing the will of the heaven and i heaven will not let his servant suffer till he completes his mission it's almost prophetic you mm. like it's so beautiful when you read these things like when, i'm so moved when i read confession uh, of writings of confessions or zoroastra like uh, mind blowing it's like you can see like when i this is the thing when you read history you see god when you read uh, science you see god i see god <laughs> like we look right and left wherever you turn your face you shall see the countenance of god <laughs> that is you know th- that is amazing professor because one would assume th- or may assume that as being a professor within science you'd probably be more distant from uh god and religion and uh but you seem to be you know so passionate about and enthusiastic about religion and seeing god in everything this is uh, i mean it's almost counter intuitive i wouldn't have imagined you to be this way but you are that's it's it's really uh fascinating to see that Yeah thank you but yeah let's so so i think this, this point is clear this point is clarified so so the the idea of heaven in a, as a spiritual metaphor should not be confused with the heaven as our universe should not be confused with the use of heaven as atmosphere should not be confused with heaven as a multiverse that these are, uh, and, the term in the quran is used in its own context read the context people that's what professor is saying yeah and if you want to take you know if you want to blame quran because 
it you it says that you know uh, stars in the lowest heaven are used as missiles against devil why go there just say quran says quran also says anyone who has been blind in this world will be blind in here after mm -hmm. just blame you know you can you can take ridiculous conclusions from this saying that oh blind people will not get their sight in here after i mean if i mean if you want to you, you know if you want to re, if you want to stick to literalism in like that any text can be made meaningless mm -hmm. And just to be clear, that the people in the past, when they would have read that, you know, man kana fi adi a'ma fahuwa fil akhirati a'ma wa adallu sabila, they wouldn't have, they would have understood it for what it meant. They wouldn't have been trapped in the very textualist, literal perspective. They wouldn't have. Like they would have yeah. understood that this meant that, you know, here blind, whosoever is blind in this world is not speaking about disabled, kind of uh, disability blind. No, it's speaking about whosoever is blind to turn away from the truth. True. So, so that that does. I think that wraps up cosmology. I'll quickly finish evolution because that's one thing I wanted to do. I sure. will try to keep your time in mind. <laughs> but, but let me, really evolution, like, people. This so is to remind you that you all emerge from something dumb. Okay, now listen to the professor and realize that. <laughs> okay, so first of all, with evolution, there is one thing very clear. Like anybody who is telling you that there is a disagreement with biology or in with within the biological community in, with in terms of evolution is lying. Evolution is well established within biology. It's, they're either they're either lying or they're ignorant of this. They're either lying or they're ignorant or they're insane. Mm. <laughs> In the present yeah. world, in past, I don't blame them, but in the present world, it's pretty much well established. But let's see what Quran really says about human beings. Mm. And again, you can read it in a Judo Christian narrative where you think Ahad Hadith, and if you do that, that's clearly not scientific. But the question is, what is the bare amount of information that Quran gives, and does that information like? Is that information factually correct or not? Let's just discuss this. Much. I'm not even going into saying that Quran describes this or does not describe this. That's up to people to know. But I'm just saying what is the bare amount of information that Quran presents? Sure. Quran talks of creation of human from clay. Point one. Quran says that all every living thing comes from water. Point two. Quran says that in Surah 4 verse 1, it says we created you from a single nap and we created from it its mate. Point three. Uh, Quran says Adam was given the name of all things. Point four. So four points. Uh, mm -hmm. This point, the first thing, like Surah 4, 4 verse 1, you can easily understand it like we all come from a single cell and then that cell splits into two and then from that all humans are come. That, that, that's not difficult to like that can like many scholars who have tried to study evolution have said, have done that. But Quran also says that in Surah 14, so that verse that we created you from one nafs and from it we made its main. You could you could give it that interpretation that we come from one cell which splits and then from that we wow. human beings. Actually, you know, to, to be honest, I've not actually, now that you say it sounds common sense, but I've never really thought of that before about but that, nafs being referring to a cell. I didn't think of that. Yeah. But that's that, that that's just the start of it. Now I'll tell you what Quran really <laughs> says. Quran does say Quran does say that we come from one man and one uh, one woman which it says from surah 49 verse uh, verse 13. So what do we know? Let's start. So so we keep this in back of your mind and I'll tell mm -hmm. you. We know life comes from non-living uh, matter that is uh, that is hundred percent sure. It might have started in the Hadean, but definitely started in the eon <coughs> following Hadean, Archean, Archean. So it's first definitely started in that. But, so, but then how did life start? The, the theory of evolution actually does not deal with how life started. The the yeah. branch of science which deals with this is called abiogenesis. So what what do we know from abiogenesis? Okay. There is a debate in the in the experts of uh, who study abiogenesis. Did the life originate in ocean, or did it originate on land? And there are currently currently two famous. There's a very famous hypothesis. It's called clay hypothesis, which says life originated because of self-replicating clay molecules. So there were these clay molecules which had the property of self replication and that is because of which the life started. There is some more research done which indicates life might have started on banks of oceans and which, which would have some radioactivity. 
there are other theories also which indicate that life there is high prob i would say there is higher probability for life to have started on in clay or clay had a non trivial role to play in life than it than for, for, for than for the converts because uh, yeah. like these the sheer number of these hypotheses are moved there's also this hypothesis that it started deep within earth it's called deep was it's i forgot the name of that hypothesis. But then there are these things, and uh, there's also one that it started on the bank of oceans. So and this, then there is so one this, that it started... so what you're saying is this is uh, a mainstream view within that genre of science on the it's origin of life, as that right. life originated from clay. Is this what we're saying? It's one of the views is called clay hypothesis. People can Google this up, and when you Google, just Google abiogenesis, you will get that. A -A and a this clay hypothesis states that life originated from self replicating clay molecules self replicating saying, clay molecules people now i'm not saying this is the only one mm -hmm. there are others we don't understand <laughs> it's not but, the one but it's one of but the this, ones this, but this is highly probable and the, one thing is certain from the sheer number of hypotheses put in for the that like there's high probability that life life originated due to some in at a place where which was some kind of interface of la, uh, land or uh, and ocean something like uh, uh, beaches and there has, there is a theory that life originated on radioactive beaches so people i think that there was some nice interesting papers written on that so i i would I, again i would not well, put it at the level of a lot a lot does happen on the beach High, high, <laughs> high probability. High probability. I'm sure much life has also originated on the beach as well. <laughs> uh, <but that's> like <laughs> After the beach. So, so high probability that life started from, you know, from self-replicating clay molecules, possibly on the beach or deep within Earth or in the back of ocean. We have these various hypotheses, but to to say that life originated from clay is not scientifically wrong. In fact, it is highly probable, but not verified. Again. It's not verified. It, it does not. So we should be honest here and say, well, we are not sure, but it is highly possible that life originated from clay. Mm -hmm. But okay. not uh, definitely okay. verified. And there are other opinions. Uh, and there are some opinions that clay only played a catalyst role. There are many, many, like, because this field is, again, not well understood and there are many hypotheses were sometimes here like so so the, uh, so the idea of how abiogenesis started there's a lot of debate on that but this idea that life started from clay is highly probable life then life or all life originating on, from sea this is completely true like life stayed in sea for a very long time before it uh, migrated so all life coming from ocean, water, we created everything from water. Will they not then believe 100% true? Or the way it says that when, you know, God created heavens and earth and his throne was over water. So you this know, is this thing, you know, uh, that every living thing it comes from water. Is this, could, could, uh, I mean, I've understood this to mean that water is the source of life. Is that? Uh, I have. Would you... I have, I have understood it as that like like all the origin of all, every living thing that you see on Earth traces itself back to ocean. Life on okay. la land is relative. It's like you're seeing it to um, its kind of habitat. Uh, yeah. So because life... can it, am I am I because I, my understanding is life as we know it cannot exist without water. Yeah, but what you're saying is related in evolutionary terms to what I am saying because everything we are predominantly made of water because we came from water. <laughs> ah, it just right. shows okay, 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 okay. So it's related. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. So yeah. what you're saying is life's habitat being in water is central to its uh to its existence. That it, that's because it's from water. Water gave it its existence. That's what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, and it gave water for most of its existence. It only came to land relatively like few, like mm. I think five, six hundred. I don't remember. Maybe five, six hundred okay. million years ago. But for majority of its time, it was in water. Because you know, whenever there's things like let's say space exploration or other things, one of the things they look for often is water, isn't it? Because doesn't it then? Uh, correlate with light, like it is seen as a, if you can find water, it may indicate that there's some life. 
there is a high probability of the life as we understand it. But we'll come to this debate on what life is, and that's a separate debate in itself. Mm. I think we've been a bit narrow in that definition. But uh, coming to this, coming sure, to this specific sure, sure. point, mm. yes, what you're saying is correct, but it's also related to what I am saying. Mm. Because uh, say, so say life originated in self, by self-replicating clay molecules or on radioactive beaches or, or, or deep within the, on the floor of oceans or any of these other hypotheses deep within the land. There is also one theory that it originated deep within the land. And then it went to oceans and it stayed in oceans for a very long time. So this idea that all living things come from water is 100% correct. It came, life came from clay. It's also correct. Hmm, I see. And then, and then, then Quran makes then this idea that you know, we come from, I mean, every one of you, you know, our creation starts from one nafs, which splits, and then we come from that. That's fine. But then there is something more beautiful. Quran also says in Surah 49, verse 13, that all humanity comes from one man, one woman. It does not say that these man and woman were a couple. Hmm. Okay, which I, I which verse I, are you speaking about? Which verse? Surah 49, verse 13. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, carry on. Sorry. Oh. Just bring it up yeah. as well. Yeah. So what do we know about evolution of humankind? And there is something very interesting. But there is something also clearly and easily misunderstood. So let me let me clarify the misunderstanding before I actually give you that information so that people don't think I'm presenting a wrong information because it can be easily misunderstood. You see, let us is let us take Kohani, which are the priestly class of Jews. They can't marry. Okay converts you know there, there's this misunderstanding by the way that jews you can't convert into judaism you can but if you do you cannot marry kohani in kohani which are the descendants of arun arun alayhi salam they cannot marry in converts so some studies have indicated at least a certain portion of those kohanins can trace their ancestry back to somebody called they call them call him in scientific terminology y chromosome uh, uh, arun where why come the idea is how do we know that? Because we can trace some. We have mm -hmm. Y chromosome, and it can you can trace your patrilineal lineage through this Y chromosome. Okay. But say yeah. if mm -hmm. all the humans in, in some X Y Z factor had died in the world, and only the descendants of only these Kohanim were alive, and the, also the true Kohanim who were actually the descendants of Arun, then you then it would be fair to say that Arun is the father of all mankind. However, it does not mean that at the time of Arun, there were no other humans or he did not have a parent. He did not have his parents. He had parents and his children married other human beings of the time. But none of the trees which did not merge with Harun's tree survived. And only the, the that, so the, all humans can trace their common ancestry. I'm saying, for example, if, mm -hmm, if that mm -hmm. were true, then you would say that all humans could, in principle, only trace their ancestry back to Arun or all Kohenin who are real Kohanin can trace their ancestry back to Arun. It does not mean Arun was the only human being. It means there were other human beings. He had parents, but every every Kohanin alive today can trace his ancestry back to one person. I is see. that clear? So yes. So really what, what, uh, right, what 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 you're saying is that Adam Ali Salam um, may. It may be the uh, Adam alayhi salam, even though he is the father of humanity as we know it, does not necessitate that there were no other humans living parallel with Adam or preceding him. Yeah, so what it does not necessitate that either in scripture or in science, but what yeah. it would mean that no tree... And, which and did there's not many verses Adam. that actually do support this as well. It's just that because the narrative... Uh, is generally already superseding yeah, can... that. It's supplanting that. So people don't pay it. So, for example, verses like in Allah, in Allah Stafa uh, Adam wa Nuhan wa, that Allah chose, selected uh, oh, uh, Adam. Yeah. Now the question was, who did He choose him from? Uh, and and then people say, well, you know, He made him, and then obviously made him as a chosen yeah. one. But th that's. Okay. Because it's, it's so now, yeah. So what do we know scientifically? Well, you know we can trace our Y chromosome DNA back, and interestingly, we can trace it back to one man living in Africa. Okay. So so it so to say that of course this man had parents and he his children intermarried with other people, but th this fact <laughs> we can. I trace thought you were going to say it's. Uh, 
And that man is Mamadou's great 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 grandfather. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> no, a... <laughs> I don't know if Momo's actually tuned in today. So, so this man, this man, uh, we can trace our uh, this, and this is not this is not a question of theory. We can do it, and we can actually explicitly show it that all humanity today descends from one man. Which, li but there is a debate about uh, the only debate that we have is when that man. Did. So mm -hmm. this man, in terms of scientific terminology, is called Y chromosome Adam. You can Google it, uh, and he possibly lived at uh, around two hundred thousand years ago. It is he. I, I thought. I thought they were going to say, uh, right, okay, I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. So there's, a debate. Okay. there's a debate on mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a debate. Mm -hmm. But the predominant studies show that he was around 200,000 years are you Are you placing Adam with chromosomal Adam? Is that what we're what you're doing? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've always, I felt, always is an <laughs> intriguing word, but I felt that Adam Ali Salam was the father of the cognitive revolution. Uh, the, the uh, it, it boils down to that also, and I'll tell you how. What I, I'm, I, in fact, I've seen your views and I like them, and I will tell you how they fit with this view. Uh, sure. On the other hand, we can trace back the ancestry of all living female on Earth to one woman again in Africa, uh, who is called microchondrial Eve, and then there's a de generational. They might have because we cannot, dis uh, you know, with the, yeah. there's a I debate about when they live. They could have been contemporaries, but there is a higher probability that this Eve, mitochondrial Eve, lived around 150,000 years ago. So Adam lived at least 50,000 years before Eve. <laughs> before or oh, after, I think. I think they put chromosomal Adam. No, that that have changed before. It was after, and then it became before. Before. Oh uh, right. Okay. So, so. Uh, and 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 it might be probable that they might finally coincide. But I think <laughs> if you have this Adam living before Eve. Then you can give another interpretation to the verse 49, uh, surah, like verse 4, surah 4, verse 1. That because it verse says that we created from him its mate. It might be that Eve might actually be a daughter of Adam from the generations ahead. Mm, I see, I see. Okay. Mm. That might be an interpretation. Or, but we are not sure of the dates. You know, We know that humanity can trace his ancestry back to one man, like my chromosome Adam. One woman, mitochondrial Eve. We are not sure when they live. They could, it could have been one is the daughter of another, one is the father of another, mm, no. or a vice versa. Maybe the dates change in future, or maybe they are contemporaries. We don't know much. Yeah. But let's. Yeah, because yeah, you on. know, I this is the same point that I I mentioned this a while back on my a good while back on one of my Monday nights and and in several discussions, private discussions I've had with people that I've said that. You know, one of the things that does stand up for faith, whether people like it or not, but in my perspective, is that, look, science has emerged with all these discoveries and all these amazing things. And obviously it's unearthed things like evolution and it's shown that. But yet, if we're just looking at it from a scientific perspective of randomness, it ought to be that, let's say, as uh, homo sapiens were adapting, they were evolving, that it ought to be multiple and it ought to, like, we ought not to be able to trace our ancestry back to just one. It ought to be multiple. Like, if we're, uh, if we're looking at it from this thing of pure random, um, it could be. whereas, and I said, and I said, and it's interesting how scripture or, you know, it's so easy that it could have just got that so wrong. But it, in a yeah. way, it didn't. And that's and it science is. today unearths that. That, oh, wow. OK, that's fa so I, I, I find that, that very fascinating. Yeah. And what is more fa like what is interesting, going back to what you were saying before, is this idea that you were saying that Adam is the father of the cognitive revolution. At the, at the basic level of cognition lies our ability to speak. Mm -hmm. And now, now there are three things we seem to be converging. Nobody, I think, has linked them, but there are three independent things we seem to be converging. One is that, let's leave mitochondrial Eve for the moment. She might have lived with Adam, she might have been after her, but let's focus on Adam. But it's interesting how any of the verses of the Quran that speak of human origin, not the story, even the story of Adam as well, never actually mention Eve. The Quran doesn't no. mention Eve. 
which is interesting. In, yeah. in, it says in Surah 49, verse 13, that we created you from one man and one woman, but it doesn't say that they were couples, right? Can you check that? Right. So, yeah. Okay. Let me bring that. 49, 13. Yep. Yep. Carry on. Sorry. And I'll bring that up. So, but, uh, but yeah, the, let's focus on Adam because I think Adam is the person to be focused on here in the whole narration. So, let's say 200,000, let's take this view that Adam came around two to 300,000 years, that's the time given, but let's say 200,000 years ago. And there is something else which can have its origin at 200,000 years. And you know what is that? Modern language, language as we know it. Oh, right. Sorry. Mar yep. This is the, the popular verse you're referring to of Surah Hujarat, uh, or is it Surah Hujarat, which is, Ya yun nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakrim wa untha wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu inna akramakum inda Allah atqaqum. That, O oh people, we created you from a male and a female, min dhakrin wa untha, a male and a female. Everybody is created from male and female, but yeah. it could mean uh, it could mean Y chromosome, Adam and Microcron, real Eve, which is quite uh, accurate. But let's sure. focus on this particular thing that two hundred. Let's say it, uh, that it's highly likely that Adam came around two hundred thousand years ago. Even though the time span is between two hundred. But and what is interesting is it doesn't say out of curiosity. I'm just saying not that to get caught up on it, but it doesn't say a man and a woman, but it says male and female. That's I'm just saying that it's interesting, but. It's okay. interesting. Yeah, yeah, there might be something more to it. Definitely, mm -hmm. we can explore that. There might be some more meaning to it. But let's come to this particular thing. Sure. That 200,000 years, around 150 to 200,000 years ago is the time when language is. And it is 200,000 years ago is the time when anatomically modern humans evolved. So they are the subspecies of Homo mm -hmm. sapiens which look like us. But evolution of language is even more interesting because if you see Noam Chomsky's view on it, it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I find this view very interesting. I mean, he argues that language came up because of a single mutation. Like humans were already ready for it, but there was the, just one missing block which occurred by one random mutation. And then he gives this analogy of a crystal. You see, in crystal, if you have, like, you have water, it's already cl close to freezing temperature. And then you have one nucleation and bingo, whole of the crystal forms. So if, if one of the humans had this mutation for sophisticated language, it goes from, like, you can't, can count one, two, nine, three, four, five, and then you can jump to infinity. When you had this abstract realization, which might have occurred through a genetic mutation, it would, now this is what I'm thinking, it would have given his children, if it, can, if it was inherited, immense survival advantage. And then that is why maybe history dominated. And and it also fits with what Quran is talk, saying. Quran is saying that the speciality of Adam came because God taught him the names of all things. With names came, you know, it's not just spoken language. The idea is that language is a, the our language is based on an abstract thinking, which is embedded in us, genetically embedded in us. And because of this abstract thinking, we can realize the abstract concepts like God, and we can realize many abstract concepts. And this is this is something special that we Homo sapiens have had, or rather, and not mickly modern humans have had. And it, I'm not saying that we have we, this is good, but it again, it would be interesting if any of the audience wants, they could take it up as a PhD project. Maybe relate these three things. <laughs> but, um, you, you're thinking too highly of this audience. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is all GCSE dropouts. This is yeah. They still we're still <laughs> like. Uh, <laughs> But They're you know, like, instead of wasting, what, what instead, time of, is wasting it? Time with, <laughs> instead of wasting time with creationist nonsense that is coming from Discovery yeah, Institute, yeah. try relating this. You know, there is the idea of Noam Chomsky's view on language that language yeah. could, could have occurred because of a single mutation in a human. I'm not saying that this be, me, need be the only case. There can be other origins of language, and then this would hold no, metaphor. Noam, Noam Chomsky, because a lot of his evidence that he's uh, because he also posited the. Uh, the LAD language acquisition device theory in saying, stating that the brain is, uh, uh, he argues, hardwired to uh, for language. So it's, it's kind of preset for language, as opposed to the other theory that as we're born as children, we have the ability to absorb language. So th these are the two kind of theories where Noam Chomsky is at the head of that the first theory saying no it is not a uh, it is not something socialized it is internal it's it's, it's, it's yeah it's nature it's not nurture and 
and a lot of the evidence is he's even used for that and then other subsequent people as well have be, has been much, very compelling of how children even given certain circumstances where they've lived in very kind of pigeon speak have formed their own creole making a complete language themselves independently of their parents and it's um it's it's been there's a lot of research which shows that but yeah sorry carry on yeah so this is very interesting that all these things uh, the development of a, mo a, lang a, la a modern language at least a primitive language which then evolved into different modern languages and there's a lot about it in how african languages have more structures than many languages because it, they seem to come from a pre language like, like a language which evolved subsequently and lost some uh, some of the structure but anyway uh, mm -hmm. so this idea that language evolved around 200000 years ago there was 200000 years ago there was you know we can is trace it, the just uh, yeah. uh, just to say there is some argument now that uh, neanderthals had some form of language but not as sophisticated or as developed uh, as as modern sapiens so it yeah. seems that they had because the the kind of the way the larynx is kind of placed it's in between humans and apes and it seems that they may have had like very high pitched kind of certain sounds I'm that others did not have i'm just saying that this idea of abstract language this abstract, idea of excellent, abstract, excellent abstract abstract yeah. by language i don't mean the ability to speak abstract reason, ab reason abst in an abstract sense mm -hmm. so this idea of uh, this idea of innate ability to reason in an abstract sense mm -hmm. the it's it's date converging with the development of uh, anatomically modern humans and it's date converging with y chromosome adam there seems to be something interesting going on at 200000 years but it might be that you know the, uh, the, it might be there might be more to it or you know but this is something that people can research into but the idea that humans are humans adam was given names of all things it, it again it's highly probable not verified you know that was that the reason why he still why history dominated but the idea that we can come from one man if you just take this idea that we from one man and we, you can even add even though quran doesn't i think explicitly say that as as explicit there as for one man but even one woman it's fine mm -hmm. these things are scientifically correct so you don't need to deny a theory of evolution for that these things are inbuilt in theory of evolution the only thing is that this man adam alis nam had his parents had his, had you know had his friends and all this but then he, as quran says it he was proper like his race dominate and the, and there is no so it would be right to say that no but there is nobody who is surviving independent of the tree there oh, were other uh, trees they died yeah. they died down so the only tree that survived so all the tree that that remains to us is adam and even mycochondria so mm -hmm. Pretty much hundred percent matching with like there is no conflict of data between what Quran is saying and what the theory of evolution is saying. And, and Plus, I, I know I mentioned to you previously that my thinking on on some of this, and I've said that the the verses that speak of Adam Ali Salam eating from this forbidden fruit, whatever it was, uh, are followed by them covering, and you see uh, shame is something which is one a it's a it's generally a social phenomenon it's in the presence of others that human beings tend to feel uh, but it's also linked to greater self-awareness um and and i felt that 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 verse is is showing that adam salam, at this stage of whatever that stage was that phenomenon that he he undergoes he experiences a greater self-awareness he experiences shame and he wants to cover, you know, they try to cover their, their nakedness. And this made me think that, you see, it, it seems, from evidence seems to suggest that other species, Neanderthals and, and, and other sapiens as well, they would have covered, they would have had like uh, some kind of coating and things like this. But it made me think that maybe that was simply for warmth. And it wasn't to do with shame. And that shame may have been just something that came with this greater self-awareness. I Again, I never thought about it. But this is something we need to really research. Like, there's much more to it. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But this, there's a lot more to research here. But the important thing that I think we can highlight right now to people is that there is nothing innate in Quran which contradicts evolution. In fact, there's a lot which supports it. I'll end uh, the discussion of evolution and that will take five more minutes and hopefully we'll wrap with that. But uh, I'm just worried about your time. But there is, in Surah 71, verse 14 says, we created you in stages. And mm-hmm. in Surah 71, verse 17, Khalaqa, it says, atwara, created you in stages. Yeah. And in Surah 71, verse 17, it says, we grew you like a vegetation from earth. Mm. I mean, you cannot imagine. Like, if you, see min al ardi from, you know, if you see what happens when you grow, when you sow a seed, you, you start with a simple structure and then it diversifies. There cannot be a better metaphor for everything. <laughs> this yeah. is, uh, and and also, also, bit- the, you know, there's this the verse as well that speaks about uh, insana. Uh, Allah speaks about the origin of insan, um, and it mentions uh, in in this particular in the verse in this particular verse, people say that because Allah is speaking of insan. He says, and that insan, obviously, al insan speaking about, they say Adam alayhi salam, that means sulalatim min teen, yeah, that this kind of something, this extract from clay or whatever. And people say, well, that's obviously Adam. So all the mufassirin write that that's Adam. But then Allah says, thumma ja'alna hu, then we placed him nutfatan fi qararim makin. Then we made him a drop of sperm in a a firm place which would be the embryo now uh, uh, you see here the mufassirin get confused because the, they say well the pronoun him we placed him the first him was adam it says in son then we placed that in son as a drop of sperm so some people try to say well we can't say adam was in a womb so you know what this is now speaking of someone else but that seems to break the flow of the verse. Now, other Mufassirin felt that, okay, maybe Adam too then was created in some kind of artificial womb. But I said, well, why, why go to artificial when there were wombs about? You know, that you don't need to create an artificial womb. Wombs already existed. So, yeah. And, and you can also look at it in another way. You know, it starts with, you know, so, uh, we, we, we clay and then it evolves to, because Nutfa can also mean simple life. And then, then it it might be talking about various stages of evolution. Yeah. Because yeah. what happened within the womb actually happened in evolutionary stages. Yeah. Like if uh, you see, I, I, I meant, I meant, I meant from the stage that the Quran is in this verse overwhelmingly supporting that Adam was born of womb, like he oh, yeah. was. Oh, yeah. This verse oh, yeah. seems to uh, clearly lean that way. Like you could, you could interpret it differently, but in all honesty, you are doing a lot of acrobats and gymnastics in trying to interpret it. If you just read that verse with no other, you know, just with a clear, clean slate, you read it, you would understand that the first insan that is being addressed was in born from womb because that's what the verse says yeah yeah but let's yeah so so I, and i even in terms of what happens within the womb is what happened in nature anyway yeah. so and then then this beautiful metaphor about us growing like vegetation from earth in simple words i can't but think of the a reason metaphor. why i was stressing that professor is because a lot of people feel that to say adam was born of womb um is kufr it's disbelief like people feel that this is you know it, because allah says in another verse that about adam oh i created you with my ha- own hands so how could this be if he's of womb now the this is why i was just stressing that the actual verse of the quran another verse of the quran see it states by its if just looking at it at face value that Adam was of womb. This is born from womb. That's what and, that's what it states. And, and it's interesting because the people, like for example, people come up and say, "Oh, Adam is created from the hands of God. So how can it be evolution?" You see, even if I take Salafi methodology, like here, they would say that we don't interpret this verse because you can't interpret what how hands of God are. That would take you into Asher, being an Ashari. So when you can't interpret it, means you can't even negate it. When you can't negate it, you keep going. We do the interpretation. <laughs> 
is when you are negating it, you are interpreting it. <laughs> what makes you say, say that the hand of God is not the theory of evolution, <laughs> like the process of evolution? And this, you know, and it, it goes back to what I was saying, you know, evolution is enhanced by biology. Okay, I see and... what you're saying, that you, what you're saying is, we're alive saying that, uh, that I've created you with my hands. The hands of God could be interpreted as the force of evolution, the nature of uh, evolution yeah, itself. It's like, hmm. Evolution is like a reflected light, which reflect, it goes back to that. Which you see, to be evolution. fair though, a lot of people understood this just by language, you understood it to mean with, you know, like as Ibn Hazm would have written and other people, Bil Inaya, that you, that God created Adam, like as in Adam is a creation, a result of care and delicate, like delicate, to show a kind of bond and affection. You know, if you say, look, I uh, brought you like I brought you up with my own two hands, I, you know, to a child. It doesn't it doesn't mean you physically brought up the child with your own two hands. It's kind of de reflecting a, a delicacy and intimate kind of relationship that you have with the person. Hmm. Yeah. So I think with that, we have like we have an, like the main problem that they have had what happens to the creation of Adam. It's very simple. Uh, like the the idea that humanity comes from one one person is not the basic data given in Quran is not again science. The only problem is this person had parents and he had there were other trees and there is no tree remaining which has which is not from this person. Uh, you might argue uh, in any way, but this basic data given in Quran and the fact that life can originate from clay and that life has come from ocean. I mean, you it's know, so... And, you know, just to be clear that because we do carry part, m most people carry part, um, you know, DNA, a tiny part from other species as well, like in the sense, uh, let's say 1% to 4% Neanderthal non-Africans, non yeah. And then maybe 1% to 2% of uh, Denisovans and, and they say a fourth species as well, potentially. That isn't really a contradiction in the sense of an overall, because the overwhelming majority is what it is. Is That's... I mean, yeah, it, it's like being, like if the true Kohanin, they might contain if the true Kohanin who can trace their ancestry back to our own, they might have other trees mixing in. But yeah. at least one, like one of their ancestors goes back to our own. That yeah. is the important thing. So and it, here, it's, it's and not here, the, it's the overwhelming thing does go back to chromosomal Adam. It doesn't. Homo sapiens are have, Homo sapiens. Yeah. Like you know, like by the time we have we have, we have our parents, 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 we, you know, the trees diversify. One of that person that we can trace our ancestry back to is Adam. This is important. Yeah. And then there are other trees mixing, so which is very interesting, and it's it, and this is completely correct. The, the, it, 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 yeah, it, so so there's nothing in Quran which contradicts evolution. In fact, it or willingly supports it and people don't even need like some people who try to justify evolution with Quran they go to metaphorical interpretations of Adam you don't need to do that because you know what Quran is stating is perfectly correct mm -hmm. it is only that if you start viewing it in terms of with the help of Ahad Hadith and, Hadith and Genesis narratives and imagine that Adam had no parents and there were no other trees and no other humans then you would get into trouble and you but know you... I, I always I, I marveled how the Quran never explicitly ever it avoids to say certain things like even when it's speaking of Jesus and they ask of Jesus, it could have just very easily just said like it could have just said, look, by the way, Adam had no parents. There's nothing, you know, if the Quran had said that the people in the day and age would have just accepted it as well. It wouldn't have the message wouldn't have flopped. But because people wouldn't have known about evolution in that sense, and they would have just accepted that, okay, you know, fair enough, there was just one person and he came out of nowhere. But the Quran never said that still, despite the audience being, you know, very receptive to even that idea. Now, mm -hmm. in a similar way, when Allah, when they ask about Jesus, and Allah doesn't say, Jesus doesn't have a, a dad, but rather says, oh, well, he's like Adam, uh, answering it enigmatically. Uh, and I've always found that quite interesting, very interesting. I find it very beautiful because it has this dual structure in it. You see, if you said 
Jesus did not have, have Jesus had, did not like had a father, then you completely shut Christians off. Then you, there is no question, or you know they will not listen to anything, especially if they are Catholic and or, or Orthodox. You will not, they will not listen. Protestants might, <laughs> but yeah. But you know what? It goes back to this dual structure I have been talking about. So you can read it as Jesus and Adam both had no parents, or you can read it as Jesus and Adam had parents and they were both misunderstood to not have parents. Hmm. So, yeah. you, so <laughs> and there is a dual reading possible, and this dual reading makes it beautiful because you know it will make a scientist comfortable, and it will make a like it will make a scientist like me comfortable, and it can also make a Christian comfortable. And so, 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 so there is this dual reading possible. And when it comes to Judo Christianity, Quran does this over and over again and again. I mean, Quran doesn't even explicitly say if Ismail or Isaac was sacrificed. We have inferred yes. Ismail, but there's a wisdom yeah. to it. And many, and many uh, Muslims did, uh, although they were the minority, did infer it was Ishaq. Yeah, because in any case, if it had said one or the two, whatever the actual case was, apart from that. If it had said Isaac, Arabs would have found it problematic. And if it had said Ismail, Jews and Christians would have said found it problematic. So Quran has this innate dualistic reading possible that every group can be uh, comfortable. I mean, I'll sit down with you someday, hopefully, and we will discuss Judo-Christianity in Quranic perspective. It's very interesting again. But let's come, let's finish this topic up. Mm, sure. I want to come to... Oh, by the way, Colin Turner had given his salam from Durham. I'm not sure if you oh, know him. Do you know? Michael well, yes, I was a postdoc when he when I met him. <laughs> All right, two but, minute, two uh, minute. But let's come to let's come to one thing. You see, one of the really interesting things I find now I'm talking about life beyond us. One of the nice things. So we're done with evolution. Now we're talking about life beyond us. One of the nice <laughs> things that I find about Quranic narrative is that it says we created seven heavens and of earth a similar number. In geocentric model of earth, there is no way to fit this again. Yeah. But mm. this is, this is well, again I mean, a very interesting... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I was going to say in the first woman, uh, seven heavens and from the earth, like them as well, like the heavens as well. Now, this is interesting because it's very kind of mind-boggling. When you read it, you think what what is this talking about because there's only one earth there ain't seven earths so i don't know yeah but again in terms of this idea that you know seven could be many yeah, here many. seven yeah here mean that like just like uh there are many universes in all in many of those universes and surely in our universe there are other planets that have contained life mm. so this is very interesting and then, you know, what I find really interesting in Quran is, for example, Surah 17, verse 70, it says, God has preferred humans over a large number of what he has created, not over all of what he has created. Yeah, that, so that surely is... there are things which are more higher in terms of consciousness than humans, high, capable of doing higher evil and or higher good, able to reach, you know, divine much and that's, better than You know humans. what's interesting there as well? It specifies the children of Adam. And, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ لَيْسَ عَلَى كُلْ You know, not upon yeah, of not everything, but وَلَكِنْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ But many... Which is, yeah. which is true, like, one will predominate, but does not mean that there are not alien species which are much higher than us. I mean, one thing that I blows my mind apart is this verse, Surah 40, verse uh, 57, when it says that the creation of heavens and earth is a greater thing than the creation of men, but most men know not. This blows my mind apart because, wow. you know, in most of the world religions and even in Islamic theology, humans, humans, humans are supposed to be the center thing about the creation. But Quran just says, no, that's not true. I mean, in Surah 40 verse 29, it says we created heavens and earth. So heaven here meaning the universe and put living creatures in both of them. So there are definitely living creatures in the universe. And even though we have preference in terms of we are preferred over all life on earth, there is no way we are preferred in all life on in our universe and certainly not the multiverse. And I find it so nice that Quran says that, you know, you, you're too small. The creation of heaven and earth is much greater than your creation. But you don't know. You think you're the center of the universe. You're not. <laughs> I find it so amazing that it, Quran talks in this way. Like this hits a core so deep with me because one of the problems that you have 
with many religious philosophies and including the way medieval Islamic philosophy has developed. It is so human centric. Everything is made for Muhammad. Really, like a person living on planet Earth, and you mean to you you want to tell me that all the universe, everything, you, all these galaxies are made because of Muhammad? Like or Jesus? Seriously? Like seriously? <laughs> You're gonna get a, a fatwa or two of kufr. Uh, coming <laughs> when people watch this they're going to be like this dr mir fazal kafir hai yaar kafir kafir <laughs> the problem is the problem in central mankind is that if you take prophets as moral you know your moral anchors as, as you know as lamps in the your somehow of dunya then this is beautiful but if you take them like you know if you place them as best examples for humankind i can see that but you know it, if you try to divinize them and mm. blow them out of proportion then then it doesn't make sense to me i mean you have to understand that there are alien lives out there for which we are really primitive we have self consciousness so we are worth something but there might be species which are way advanced than us and to say that they were created because of us just it i mean i always feel this way it's like somebody sitting in a small village and saying you know what Uh, America is making this policy, and we say in the Cold War and fighting with Russia because of because they want to get because of what I have done here to in my garden. This would seem absurd. They would be like serious. <laughs> you have to lie to your scales at me. You know this. Uh, <laughs> there's a story me. in it. <laughs> there's in Arabic. There's a story that this uh, one of the caliphs was. Uh, he was going past and he sees uh, he, he, you know they have these uh, people who clean the sewers they call them in urdu uh, bangis <laughs> and you know like so th- basically people cl- clean the toilets and sewers and stuff so these kanafin in arabic kanaf and he he's going past the caliph is and he's on this kind of uh, in this uh, you know whatever he, he's going in his thing but he overhears this conversation of these two kind of sewer men <laughs> <laughs> right so one of them says to the other he says you know he says have you see, heard the recent politics between the caliph and you know his wazir and this and that he says you know what since the caliph has said this he's lost all respect in my eyes like he's dropped from my like <laughs> he says main nazron se gir gaya yaar you know he's like dropped from my you know the status has dropped <laughs> and this is a guy in the, who, who's working in the sewers <laughs> so the caliph <laughs> looks at him and he says uh, it, it became a proverb proverbial statement that he says amfum fil ma wa istum fi sama he says he says <laughs> his nose is submerged in water <laughs> he, he, yet his ass is fl- floating in the sky <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just like this guy like, to, like like how can i have dropped from his you know the way he's saying it just look at him <laughs> no but this is true. Like, like we have to we have to be careful like you know i i one of my like i met once people from hari krishna moment who were trying to argue that god is a planet living on god is a human living on some planet i told him like you know and after we after a while he got convinced like he was talking nonsense and i told him you know what just next time you pray just go out in the garden and turn to turn to the sky and say god you're a, you are great and i'm just an ape <laughs> remember that remember who you are don't like don't blow yourself out of proportion you are an ape who has been bestowed with a bit of intelligence you have been given a little but a little so so and they... don't blow it out of proportion you live remain in your limits so we're basically elevated apes as opposed to fallen angels huh that's what you're yeah we just <laughs> elevated dignified apes what? but not for yeah, an angel yeah i think if i eat that's a nice way and it's important that humans go out in i think this is a really nice prayer whenever you get this delusion about who you are turn to sky god you are great i'm just an ape that's a nice prayer to make <laughs> so that you remember your humble origins i mean humans have this problem of ego it irritates me like seriously like they blow things out of proportion they forget who they are <laughs> Yeah. No, I'm yeah. with you. But but then you know like Quran again so I think with this 
literally Quran has this beautiful structure sometimes, but confusing the scales of this structure gets people confused. Like for example, there's this verse, God created the heavens and earth and his throne was over water. To, and then it, mm. I think it says to, to test which of you does the best of deeds. Here it's, you know, it's scaling down first from the universe. Then it's saying water, like your, you know, evolution starts from water and then you are there. And then, then the discussion shifts to you, if I remember correctly. Yeah. But is that, what's the verse? Do you yeah, remember I mean, that? You know, I, th I mean, it, uh, the, the thing about the throne, Ar-Rahman al-Arshistawa, or this istiwa al al arsh comes. The throne of God was over ma. Verse oh, wa kana, oh, wa kana arshu al al ma. Yes. Yeah, so it means that the concept of evolution, this is again for me to indicate that the evolution of life started from water. And mm -hmm. because if you, like, can you read Mufti, Surah 11, verse 7? It's actually a really nice verse. Can you find okay, that? Just one moment. I can indeed. Let me just go through all the security checks on my phone. This is uh, uh, verse. Sorry, say that again. 11. 11, 7. 11, 7. Right, Surah Hud. Let me just go in there. وَهُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ and it is he who created the heavens and the earth in six days. And his throne was above water. And that he may test you or try you to see who is the best in action. But yeah. Oh, yeah, but this is nice. what I'm saying is that it starts from the scale of the universe, comes yeah. down to the scale of you know evolution in water and then says that you are the product of this and because of which you would do to see which if you do what kind of deed you do again salivation and here and then is and then it goes on the same verse uh, it does because i stopped there but it does say well in culta in a kum mabauthuna min ba'dil mawti la yaqulanna alladhina kafaru in hatha illa sihrun mabid and if you tell them that you will once again come to life after death they will say that is but only magic. Um, now, I suppose that links in the whole thing of creation and the concept of death as well, isn't it? Because in yeah. a way, you're seeing everything from nothing, like the cosmos emerging from... Because one of the things... Because now, you know, people, we have this thing of, look, uh, you know, we have this understanding that matter is just energy. Yeah? And from energy you know, comes matter. But prior to this understanding, can you can, can you think that to tell somebody matter, rocks, things come from nothing, like a sense of nothingness, like they don't, it's, it, it can't be bits computed. From, yeah. It's from bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. But it doesn't but make any know, sense, does it? So to them, that's just saying and, magic. And, and you know, Mufti, it would, hopefully we will do that next time, but it goes back into how salivation and, you know, our journey to God is related closely to evolution. What I told you last time when we were discussing that it says, when Quran says that you prefer the lower life, but the final outcome hereafter is much better. So hereafter, of course, means, you know, Quran doesn't say that we will continue our existence post-life. It says you will be recreated in a form that you do not know. But then these are separate discussions we should have one day. Sure. But uh, but then this idea that you know we prefer like uh, lower life like sex and other things your pre you know pre evolutionary like your mammalian brain or oh. your reptilian brain. I thought I thought how did the and, conversation jump to sex? I thought I missed an no, episode but, here. <laughs> I thought wow we jumped to the juicy part straight away and I, and I, I, I must have fallen asleep and missed all of that. <laughs> no, but. <laughs> The idea is that your cerebral cortex covers your higher things, and that is what should, what gets activated, and then the final that, outcome. That, is because professor, that would be a language that all of our audience would immediately understand. <laughs> <laughs> we're still we're still operating at that mammalian level. You see, the reptilian level. We're like, Ugh. <laughs> no, I think you're operating at higher levels. But yes. So I think one of the things is that, you know, with this, there are some small, like, you know, there are some small misunderstandings left here and there in certain uh, understandings by, by of God. certain verses. <laughs> uh, no, no, some... not by God, of course. <laughs> by our understanding Just of some it. small misunderstandings left here and there by God. But... By, 
<laughs> verses of Quran. Uh, and I think what would, what, what, yeah, but the important thing is, you know, if you can, you can, like, if you want to stick. So this is the thing. The, the, who, like, let's, I'm even concluding this thing, but now this is the important thing. Who is this lecture important for? If it is like people who have fixed mind, like you might be a Salafi thinking that I want to actualize the meaning of Quran in terms of what Sahabas understood it. I want to recreate seventh century Arabia. You're more than welcome to do so. This lecture is of zero benefit to you. Like or you're, if you have dogmatic fixed your, people, people who are dogmatic. Dog, dogmatic. Equivalently, if you have fixed the meaning that the meaning of Quran is again seventh century Arabia, therefore. Quran cannot have a scientific reinterpretation. Again, this it won't be meaningful of you to, you know, listen to be to honest, this lecture. Look, the thing is that y y any person would know that um, that that can't. This statement can't uh, essentially be true. I was asked also in a dialogue with an ex-Muslim where he asked me that. Look, what you're saying is fine, but let's be honest. Do you think the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu understood it in this way? And then second question is follow question, follow up was that, are you then not saying you know more than the Prophet? Now, my response to that was, look, that's a misleading question because the Prophet sallallahu himself, the Quran it's, is from the Prophet. And the Quran has things in it like Alif Lam Mim, for example. And the Prophet is in, himself saying, look, verses of the Qur'an are saying they are mutashabihat, they are things we don't know what they mean, they are things that may be understood in different ways. So it, it doesn't mean that you are somehow more intelligent or more righteous or more, it just means that in your time, this will this understanding will unfold in front of you, that's all. One second, I just want to fix my charger, just give me one second. Okay. People, that is uh, Professor Mir uh, Faisal, who has really, with, with the amount of information he's been giving us, it's really just totally blown my mind. <laughs> I was explaining earlier on that I've shifted my schedule from uh, being a vampire to a normal human being, and it's 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 been a, 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 a it's you know it's. It, it's it's differently productive, differently, and it's I mean I am liking it, but it really wears me out at this stage. But all this information has been amazing. Yep, Professor. So yeah, Mufti, you're back. Okay. So I, I think this is the important thing, you know, Mufti. Before we can even sorry, uh, before we can like before even we can go to this interpretation. See, there are only two <coughs> ways of approaching Quran in terms of its content. One, you can say that its meaning is actualized at the time of profit. Then if you do take that and if you do, do take the view that, for example, scholars of the past <coughs> are our large stick of understanding it, it is impossible to do these scientific interpretations. I mean, the problem is people miss, like mix, you know, become mixtures of the two. Either you become a Salaf and say, you know what, I'm not going to use reason. I'm not going to think, basically. And... People in past have understood it. I'm just blindly going to follow them. Uh, in fact, this is exactly the interestingly the arguments that were given by enemies of the prophets in Quran. Like <laughs> they used to say, "We shall follow mm. our predecessors, our fathers of old." Yeah, yeah. They said, "This is what yeah. our fathers." Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the prophets come with truth. So either you become a person of tradition or truth. If you're a person of, or you know, interestingly, sometimes. People who are against Islam and people who have this literalistic understanding of Islam, they agree on what Islam is. It is people like us who have rather a different understanding. They both tell us that you don't understand it. I have a thing that we have a dualistic understanding of the Quran possible. I'm not saying linguistically their, their arguments cannot be justified. But linguistically, you can have this alternative reading of Quran, which is completely consistent with modern science. Not only that, Subtle hints without within Quran will show that it is hard to interpret it that way, rather natural to interpret it this way. For example, does Saba Samawat mean this geocentric model of Earth with, you know, which was given there, uh, or does it mean multiverse? Well, in the Saba in the geocentric model of Earth, you have only one Earth and you have heavens like stars on the top in the highest Sama, and Quran just says stars in the, are in the lowest Sama, and then it says there are equal. 
as there are many samawats, there are equally many earths. This does not exist in any of those worlds. Yeah. So subtle hints like this. No, absolutely. But, I think I think yeah. it's amazing. I was going to say, Professor, a few people are asking some questions. If we if if we take some yeah, rapid yeah. rapid round questions, I know I my yeah. <laughs> my clock is kind of like uh, shut down biological yeah, clock, exactly but I'm <laughs> I'm fighting it, people. I'm fighting it. Don't worry. So there's a question here that uh, oh, where did it go? It was a technical question for you. Oh, bloody hell, did it just... Oh, Mufti, please ask him about the two theories in physics. Uh, adding crass of Sylvester James Gates and Orch Orr of Roger Penrose and Stuart Hammeroff. I've got no idea what he... I, I did recognise the name Roger Penrose, so Roger Penrose. Uh, hello, Professor, you there? Have we just lost Professor? Un momento. Verte. I think. Professor, are you. What's going on? Professor. Hello, hello. It seems to be a poor network there. It's saying on. Uh, let me. Just one moment. I'm just cool. Uh, right. All right. Whoa. <laughs> My phone just died down. <laughs> All right, I see. Uh, Yep, yep. I can, can, you, can you hear me? Uh, I yep, can hear I you. Can. Yep, yep. Uh, all right, you're back now. Uh, you're back. Sorry, we can see you. There you were. Yeah, my phone died, so I'm calling you from my computer. Ah, oh, I see. I see. So, uh, it, yeah, it, see. so, I can hear an echo coming back. But uh, okay, sh I'm not sure. There was a question. I'm not sure if you understood uh, that James, question. Yes. yes. So it's a James Gates work on. The fact that in superstring theory, it goes back to what I am saying. In superstring, can you hear me? I can. I, I can. can. Yeah. 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 Okay. So in superstring theory, the, that he has said that you know you can reduce it to a computer code, not an, any kind of computer code, a self-replicating computer code. But it goes back to what I am saying that no matter what approach you take, he has taken superstring theory and he has applied certain graph theoretical techniques to it. But that which may or may not be correct. I mean, it's a really nice uh, theory. It once tried to do something with it, but actually wasn't able to, like I, I did not finish that work. It was a very interesting work I had tried to do with a mathematician where we tried to use some other graph te theoretical techniques. But anyway, the important thing is whether you take his work on supersymmetry or you take any other work, it goes back to this. What does he say? Supersymmetry reduces to computer code, which is it. So it goes back to this, that no matter what you take, what theory you take, you take it serious enough, you will reduce to it. Or sorry, we will reduce to bit. So no matter what it you take, and you you know you take it far enough, you will reduce to bit. What he is really doing is that he's converting <laughs> supersymmetric string theories into a kind of you know into a kind of graph theory using graph theoretical techniques into a subline computer code kind of stuff. Like, and he's finding some uh, the code that it resembles is a self-correcting code, which is very interesting. I mean, it's a very very interesting thing. But yeah. Uh, but he's using, again, he's, he's doing what I usually do. He's using techniques from across the board. He's using super strings, graph theory. So not many people are familiar with it. I really liked that work. I wanted to do something with it, but uh, I even talked to a mathematician. But then, I, you know, there are many works I start, but never end up finishing. So, <laughs> so basically, it's the, the it is from the bit. And if you should, by this, by this point, understand the... Sh huh? <laughs> the I think I've highlighted that a lot. <laughs> it's nice that you can hear me on my computer. I was worried my phone got off just when you asked me a question. So people will go like, ah, he doesn't know that James Gates theory. He just... <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, there's very little professor doesn't know. There's very little. <laughs> it's a lot I don't know. And speaking of that, really, Mufti has been extremely helpful, for example, in a lot of things he has clarified for me. 
So yeah. Wow, 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 wow. People, right? So, guys, uh, mm, is the let's let's take a, another. We'll take a, a final question from here. Let me just see. Question is uh, when he says modern science can be specify modern science theory and not modern science. That's very important. I'm not sure if that's the question. Is that a question? Uh, I think that's a comment. So what a, I think what, what he might be commenting on is that when I mentioned, like, see, certain things I mentioned, which we know for sure, like there's not much debate in it. Mm -hmm. But certain things I mentioned, there's a lot of debate in it. And you know, so so we should, you, you know, it's important that we should distinguish between the two. And some things I mentioned, which may be true, but, you know, it, it would it, uh, it would be nice for people to work on it. So, so yeah, so I, uh, I think we should clearly distinguish between these different approaches. Sure. <laughs> right. Are there any, uh, I know somebody had asked me about sharing some book suggestions. Forget about me. Let's, uh, Professor, would you, would you recommend any particular books or things to people? Okay, my, this is what people say. Like, if my problem is that when I read, I read technical stuff. And <laughs> acha, 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 acha. <laughs> People, the word is, this professor is so, saying that I, I could recall, recommend, I, yeah, I don't, I, I can don't recommend a set of coloring in books, if that will yeah. help. I can recommend so, for like five-year-olds, seven-year-olds. I mean, it's very hard, especially on science, to refer to something because, uh, yeah. Basically, like my, you're thick, you're stupid, you're dumb people. Um, just accept it, embrace it. That, Life is going to get better once. Stop <laughs> denying it. Don't fight it. <laughs> I'm not saying that, but it's just, it's just like, you know, like every field has its technicality. The it, there's the bit, and then there's the sh, starting with the sh, which is you guys. <laughs> oh, no, I would not say that. <laughs> no, no. I definitely would not say that, but yeah. But yeah, it's very hard for me to recommend something on popular science because of the fact that, you know, I have read technical stuff. So you can ask me a specific question or maybe for a specific thing, I can tell you that you read this and that. Also, we discussed a lot. You know, we discussed. So you can ask me a specific thing and I can tell you where to find that. There you go, people. Right. That's uh, no, I'm just teasing. But I'm sure, look, you, these things, you have to learn them gradually. To be fair, you see, Professor, you know, my, my reading, a lot of it is very scattered. Like I learn by just what I do is I, I, I ask a lot of questions about what I'm interested in. So and I'll end up researching them. So I'll, I might Google something. Now I'm reading something. I'll find out about, let's say, an author or a book. I'll now read about that person. Meanwhile, I'll check something. I'll start reading about that. And it's like I've got these, you know, 20 different tabs open and I'm learning about a topic. And I, I, I might then buy a book on it. I might watch five lectures on it. I might... So when people well, people assume that I've just read one particular thing, so they'll ask me, you know, this is interesting. Tell me what book I should read to learn about it. Not to which what I forgot to mention is whilst I'm reading, I'm sometimes running my own theories and I'm kind of like thinking, hmm, you know, maybe this could be like this. This could be like this. And so it's really difficult, even when I'm doing certain stuff to recommend to people what to do. So I just say you have to proactively learn. Just I, I, you know, I, I do, I cannot help appreciate how similar we are, Mufti, because that's <laughs> exactly how we learn. And in terms of asking questions, this is what I tell people that when they want to do research, the idea is you ask right questions. If you have the right question, then you might. If you have an interesting question, then you know how to answer interestingly. I, but this. I wish oh, I could. I wish I could say I think in mathematical formulas, but that that, that <laughs> <laughs> that's just pure BS. If I said that, that's just <laughs> you know. Realistically, when people ask me what is my native tongue, the tongue in which you think, I thought about it and I really said my native tongue is mathematics because that is a tongue I think in. <laughs> that is how I can. <laughs> think <laughs> like everyone has his native tongue my native tongue is possibly mathematics <laughs> i would say i mean i i could i i think like that as well it's usually just a zero <laughs> mathematics <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no mashallah man professor you know what you've shared so much with us um 
This has been amazing. I, th I know there's a lot more we, we've got to discuss as well because in our own discussions, we're speaking about a lot of things which are not yes. on, 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 on air yet and not live. Uh, so we've got to do, inshallah, more sessions on the other topics. Yeah, exactly. This one, we did want to focus on science and the Quran. And there's certain verses that people highlight that they feel are contradictions or errors um, or just like they f feel, I'm not saying that, but Islamophobic or sometimes Islam critics uh, will say, oh, look, this is, you know, just foolishness being mentioned in the Quran. It doesn't mean anything. It's, it sounds silly. So I think, you know, over the past few hours, you've expanded quite, um, you know, with much detail, m you know, just overwhelmingly, really, you've kind of given so much uh, just a backdrop to all those verses. You've kind of filled in so many gaps, and people may need to watch what this this video twice or three times to <laughs> to kind of fully truly fathom. No, but I I would say most of the, this is very true because you know there are two kinds of verses people criticize. One thing is like you know people who have fixed mind they will come up and say oh Quran is not scientific because it talks of sunset. Seriously, you don't like. These are things that people can easily address. But then there were some sophisticated issues. I think, uh, like, for example, the age of the earth, the multiple use of Sama, evolution, those things, I think, needed some thinking. So so I really wanted to, like, I had been thinking about it for a while. So you get, thank you for the opportunity of getting it online. I did not know how, like, I thought of writing about it, but then the then, then question is not many people read. So it's nice is that it, I could have it. done it. And if you, wrote, if you wrote it, Professor... Uh, very few people would fathom it. <laughs> you're, <laughs> no, no. you're right in super technical. You know, this is what I said last time that, the, you know, it's it's what that meme said. You see, the more intelligent you are, the more dumb you sound to dumb people. It's like uh, the <laughs> stupid people think, why is this person saying, is he stupid? But obviously they're the stupid ones. <laughs> the person is just too intelligent for them. So, <laughs> but of the, the, the definitely one thing I agree like we had this really nice discussion on what hereafter is that and then maybe one of these days we can sit down and see if we have missed on some verses that people still indicate oh they like uh, like like I would say misunderstand those verses uh, uh, and uh, allege that there is an error in Quran even though there isn't based on that misunderstanding maybe you and me can sit down one of these days and finish hopefully deal with those and yeah it has been such a pleasure Mufti knowing you you know I had tried to know you for some time like I tried to contact you for some time but it's finally really I'm nice right, that honestly it's a, it's an honor I you know uh -huh. in my mind I I suppose it's how you see yourself as a person in my mind, I honestly, the way I see my, I, I, I you see, people might think, people might, <laughs> people are going to think, yeah, they say, like, uh, you know, the guy's just chatting BS and trying to sound, you know, say this, but I'm legitimately saying this, that I, I'm, I'm always still kind of overwhelmed by, like, kind of awestruck how people, you know, that they give me their, like, like you, Professor, like how you'll give me your time, you'll give me your attention. I'm actually deeply flattered. You know, people will say, oh, yeah, Mufti, I want to... Because in my mind, I don't see myself at all, nothing like... And I don't even see myself as, a, as an academic, academic person. I don't. I, I do love learning, that which I see as different to academia, which I, I used to... I still hate kind of... I used to hate writing assignments, and I bloody left school with no GCSEs. <laughs> but this is... Uh, so I find it amazing that a professor or, you know, people of an academic background or in that world um, share their thoughts and time with me. I find it, you know, I'm, I'm deeply indebted to you, Professor. Oh, no, Mufti, <laughs> seriously, the amount of research that you have done and put on, for example, CAM, if you sum it up and, um, of course, had the prerequisite for it, you could get easily a PhD based on that much about <laughs> And realistically speaking, in Islam, there are very few people I listen to. And Javed Ahmad Gamdi is one of them, and you happen to be another one of them. So I, it has been a pleasure talking to them. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Well, we'll have to carry this on. And yes. of course, right now is a lockdown. But if it, when it's over and you do visit uh, the UK, because you, you, 
You've spent a long time here, haven't you, Professor? Oh, I spent almost 10 years there. I did my P master's there, my PhD there, and two postdocs there. All right. <laughs> well, well, we got to do a proper in-person chill session yeah. when you, when, as I well in the future sometimes. But, but before that, we'll do our other lives. But cool. Once again, much love. Shukran. Uh, Thank you for, uh, for spending this time with us. And people, if you do want to reach out to uh, to Professor, the best way to do so is uh, by is, is, last time you mentioned about Googling email. you and then finding you through the journals. Is that still yeah, the email. best way? Email me. Just email. Google my name. Google my name. You will get my email. Email <laughs> me. And... <laughs> See, that's <laughs> it. Google my name. You'll get my email. <laughs> See me. I. I I worry people Google my name, the things that come up. <laughs> people are like, huh? He's been to prison. <laughs> but you see, with Professor, Google my name, my email will come up. See, for some people, the universe works so smoothly, doesn't it? <laughs> right. So people, much love. Take very good care of yourselves. Uh, over here, it's now approaching 3 a.m., so it's yeah. been quite a day, inshallah. Professor, once again, much love. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. People, I'm putting up the exit page. Do like, subscribe, and see you tomorrow night on Monday nights with Mufti.